Bonjour à toutes, bonjour à tous, bienvenue. C'est la 14e édition des Nouvelles Pratiques du Journalisme, c'est notre conférence annuelle. Le hashtag, si vous souhaitez poster, c'est NPDJ, NPDJ. Je suis Alice Antôme, je suis la directrice exécutive de l'école de journalisme de Sciences Po et aujourd'hui, j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter notre programme. Ça va être dense, préparez-vous. Le thème, c'est « Informer à l'ère de TikTok ». 18 speakers, une demi-journée, pas de pause, beaucoup de débats. Beaucoup de panels, des keynotes. Alors, l'enjeu ici, c'est de débattre. D'un côté, vous avez ceux qui vont vous dire « TikTok, c'est la désinformation, c'est un business, il y a des problèmes de données personnelles, des difficultés à monétiser les contenus sur ces plateformes. » Et puis, de l'autre côté, vous pouvez avoir des, des autres speakers qui vont vous dire « Mais c'est l'occasion rare de capter des jeunes de moins de 25 ans. C'est l'occasion de tester des formats verticaux de vidéos et on ne sait pas très bien comment les faire quand on est éditeur. » Voilà, vous aurez l'ensemble de toutes ces questions qui vont vous être posées. Vous aurez aussi le résultat de deux études inédites qui vont vous être révélées ce matin. L'une du Reuters Institute et de l'autre, la Tech Stack 2022. C'est la première fois qu'on le fait avec l'école de journalisme de Sciences Po et l'Executive Education de Sciences Po. Je voulais remercier aussi tous nos étudiants qui se trouvent répartis dans cet amphithéâtre, qui vont couvrir l'événement sur un site qui s'appelle npdj.fr et puis qui vont également poster sur les réseaux sociaux. Merci vraiment à eux de, de tous leurs efforts pour la couverture éditoriale. N'oubliez pas le hashtag npdj et à 13h30, si l'on tient les timings, on pourra boire un verre et se régaler de petits cocktails pour networker. Voilà, je vous souhaite une très très bonne conférence et à tout à l'heure. Um, so yes, as hopefully has been explained, um, I'm here to kind of talk a little bit about how TikTok, maybe despite what um, some relatively reactionary right-wing individuals say, is not necessarily uh, the enemy. So. As hopefully has been uh, explained and you've seen on the conference program, uh, I'm a journalist for a lot of different publications. Um, I've written two books, one on YouTube, one on TikTok, which is uh, released last year and have been uncovering alongside a lot of brilliant speakers that you're going to see, including Sophia and Francesco and, and Nick, who's coming up after me, um, a lot of things around TikTok and its importance to society. I don't think we necessarily um, fully appreciate quite how big TikTok is. Um, you know, speaking from the UK, where I am, unfortunately, because of caring responsibilities, I, I, would, I would love to be in Paris to listen to all the talks today. You know, uh, 23 million British citizens, one in three of us here in the UK, have a shared interest, because that shared interest is TikTok. Um, and when you think about those numbers, they are huge. 100 million in Europe, 100 million in the United States, more than a billion users worldwide use TikTok, and it is becoming increasingly important, not just for ordinary users, but also for journalists who are covering this. You know, I've been talking a lot about Twitter recently and the importance of covering that public square, but TikTok is increasingly a public square for a new generation. And as the user base of TikTok grows older, as parents and grandparents begin to uh, adopt TikTok after seeing their teenage kids and grandkids using it, it becomes increasingly relevant for us. So in the English language, uh, in the last week, uh, this was backdated to around about Thursday when I prepared these slides, there were almost 10,000 news stories about TikTok in English language publications alone in a single week. And we're seeing that increase over time as the platform becomes more and more relevant to all of us. TikTok, of course, is seen as an overnight success story, but actually the reality is, as I think we'll probably get into over the course of this conference today, slightly more complicated. It is far from an overnight success story, rewriting our global culture and redefining what it is that we do, a little bit more complicated than that. People think that it happened by accident, and truthfully, journalism often covers it like that. We're interested in the new, we're interested in the changes, we're interested in the revolutionary element of TikTok.
But by doing that, we often overlook its longer history. And to do that, we have to take you here. This is ByteDance headquarters in Beijing. This is the office in which TikTok, alongside a lot of other apps, were born. Um, this is ByteDance's headquarters. ByteDance is actually a huge global conglomerate. It is enormous, $300 billion company as of September 2022. It impacts and touches on all areas of society in China, not just short form video where the Chinese equivalent of TikTok, Douyin, uh, is enormously popular. And because of that huge range of tentacles that ByteDance has, we often overlook quite how important it and TikTok is. TikTok, of course, is also a massive company, $12 billion forecast revenue in 2022, according to the latest reporting, which means that this is you know, a company, if not necessarily equivalent to the likes of Google and Meta and Twitter. It is, well, in Twitter's case, actually potentially quite big, uh, but it is still very, very significant as a social media titan. And so we need to be aware not just of the business case around TikTok and the scale of the company behind it, and the fact that it's not an overnight success story, but also that it's shaping and reshaping the way that we do things. TikTok isn't an overnight success story, though we think it is, because actually the design of it came from hundreds of different options borrowed from competitors in the space. ByteDance spent ages looking through how best to present information on TikTok. They learned from predecessors' mistakes. I've spoken to former staff at Vine, which was the short form video app that, predece that was predecessor for TikTok, about how they've been basically pumped for information about how the company failed so that TikTok doesn't do the same thing. Likewise, I mean, there are many journalists that'll be speaking today who have spoken and interacted with TikTok PR who are probably highly conscious of the fact that they have changed the way that they interact with us and the sort of incidences that they see based on predecessors' mistakes. You don't see quite as many controversies in the same way that you did with YouTube five years ago because TikTok has learned from YouTube's mistakes. And there is always one goal here, and which is the perfect example of why TikTok can't be just considered this overnight success story. Yimin Zhang, the founder of ByteDance, had this single solitary goal. That is, to be as borderless as Google. And that's really why we pay so much attention to TikTok as journalists, because this is a company that aims to be as borderless as Google, as significant as Google in our lives. So that has a significant impact for us, not just as a society, but as journalists, as the watchdogs, the custodians of that society, as the truth seekers. We won't just use TikTok in the future, but we'll probably use other ByteDance apps. TikTok could be compared as a Trojan horse, perhaps. So in the same way that Google and Facebook dominate our digital lives right now, in the future, we'll probably see TikTok and ByteDance doing similar things. We're already seeing indications of that encroaching on our society and how we live our digital lives. There's TikTok Shop, TikTok Live, Fano, Rezo, Lark. So TikTok Shop, where you buy items, TikTok Live, sort of evolving what TikTok does into a live streaming format. TikTok Now, which is its Be Real quote, Fano, which is its online shopping platform, Rezo, there is its uh, audio streaming platform, Lark, its attempt at a productivity platform like Slack used by workplaces. So it's encroaching on our lives constantly. But there might be risks in that shift. And that is kind of what people have asked me to focus on in this talk. This idea of, is TikTok the enemy? Well, maybe not. You've seen the headlines, you've heard the rumours. They constantly revolve around this. Marco Rubio, many US politicians constantly talk about TikTok security risks. It's been a hot button topic here in the UK. The EU obviously still investigating. Plenty of people worldwide in India, for instance, where TikTok is banned, believe that there is a serious issue here. 
But the evidence isn't there yet. And I say yet because me and many other journalists who are far better than I am are, are trying to find that smoking gun. It is ultimately the scoop of a lifetime to find the, the bat phone between Yimin Zhang and uh, the Chinese Communist Party. We haven't yet found it. That's the issue. But even if we were to find it in the future and TikTok were to fizzle out, which I don't think it would, its legacy really is already here. And that's why TikTok isn't necessarily the enemy, because it's too late in some instances. TikTok's already rewriting the norms on social media. We do short form video in a way that really we didn't do before. We embrace the norms and the mimetic nature of TikTok in a form that we previously did not. Others are choosing to follow. You'll see this screen probably multiple times today, I imagine, particularly maybe in Nick's talk and Francesco's, because it's an indication of how short form video works. So on the left, we have Instagram Reels. In the middle, we have TikTok. On the right, we have YouTube Shorts, all three videos formats borrowing heavily from TikTok. TikTok isn't just leading the way, though. It's acting like old tech giants. It's borrowed TikTok now from Be Real in, in the most kind of uh, inverted quotes way that I can describe, which is significant because it means that it's trying to sort of cement itself in our lives and in our society. That's the challenge that we have, I think, is whether or not you think TikTok is the enemy or if it's a savior or if it's something in between, regardless of what the future holds, one thing is for sure, TikTok is here to stay. It's TikTok and ByteDance's world, and we're just going to live in it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious that it's a long, long program, so I don't want to overrun or anything like that and cause chaos. Um, sorry for the little technical problem at the start, but very, very grateful for your insight and looking forward to seeing what's coming next. Thank you very much, Chris. Now it's Nick Newman. Uh, C'est la première étude qui va être révélée ce matin uh, et il va nous en dire beaucoup plus. Nick Newman, est il est digital stratégiste um, à l'Université d'Oxford. Uh, il dirige uh, l'étude annuelle sur uh, les usages de la consommation de l'information dans uh, de nombreux pays dans le monde entier qui s'appelle Digital News Report. Voilà, Nick Newman. Merci. Thanks very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Um, really good to be here in Paris. Um, this is a preview of a report that we have coming out at the Reuters Institute this Wednesday. I think it's one of the first attempts to map what publishers are doing on TikTok. Uh, we've analyzed data from publisher accounts in 44 countries. Uh, we've interviewed 20 or so of the leading publishers about their motivations and their strategies. Um, but before we get into that, just a bit of context. Why did we re write this report about TikTok now? Why is this conference happening now? So part of the reason is this, explosive growth, essentially, in usage. This is data from our digital news report. It's an audience survey. You can see this incredibly rapid growth, in, particularly in countries with younger populations like Brazil. The numbers themselves are still... Uh, smaller than Facebook or YouTube, of course, but that changes when you look at the demographics. So TikTok is focused on younger audiences, as you can see here. 40% of 18 to 24s across more than 40 countries say they use it for any purpose, and 15% now for news. Uh, news is much more important than it used to be. Uh, so, um, you know, this is not just about dancing videos, as this person says. Uh, it brings immediate information. And part of the reason for that is uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, where TikTok became the sort of key source of communication. But it also prompted some of the biggest providers, like the BBC, for example, to start uh, TikTok accounts. So the network is growing up. Um, it's also where news is broken. It's also where news is discussed. Uh, and so that essentially is the context for why we decided to do this report about what publishers are doing and why. 
So the data I'm about to show you is uh, new data which, which aims to map the extent to which publishers are now on TikTok in different countries. And we did it by identifying the top publishers in each country based on our digital news report. And then we checked whether they would posted content on TikTok in the previous week. And we did this across 44 countries. Uh, so what do we find? Uh, we find very strong adoption in Western Europe, here in France, for example. Uh, also in the UK and Spain, something like 80% of publishers are now on TikTok. Very strong in Southeast Asia. We're going to hear from Thailand later, from Indonesia, uh, the United States, and also Brazil, where they uh, tend to adopt social media very early. <clears throat> on the other hand, only 29% of Italian top publishers are currently on, on uh, TikTok, and just 7% in Bulgaria. So this is, this is sort of fairly unevenly spread. So a huge proportion of uh, those publishers have actually gone on TikTok in the last year. So this, this sort of growth has happened quite, quite recently. And if we look at the reasons for that, so one of the main reasons is the desire to reach younger audiences. So there are many publishers are really struggling to get to that Gen Z uh, population. Experimentation is another sort of key reason. Uh, so experimenting with that vertical video, new skills, different storytelling. Uh, some people are going onto TikTok because they're worried about misinformation on the platform and they want to be there to provide reliable information. Uh, and then finally, and, and most importantly, the fear of missing out. Other people have been late to platforms before and they don't want to be late to this one. It's also important to say that um, a, a half of publishers, 51%, are not on TikTok yet. And part of the reason, uh, Chris mentioned it earlier, is, is concerns about that Chinese ownership. Uh, but also the fact there's virtually no monetization model as well. So these are some of the reasons why publishers are not on TikTok, which is important. Uh, so which publishers do best in terms of uh, follow accounts? I'm afraid some of the numbers have gone a bit wrong here. Uh, you'll have to wait and look at the full report. Um, but essentially, let's look at, at, um, at Europe first. So right at the top there actually is Daily Mail UK. It's about 4 million, just to give you an idea, 4 million followers. Um, and dominating the list, we have some of those bigger European countries, UK, Spain, France, and Germany. Uh, many of these brands uh, are early adopters. So Targenscher uh, from ARD in Germany has been there since 2019. It's about one3 million followers. But what's really striking is the success of uh, socially native uh, media companies such as Actuality from Spain, uh, Brut here in France, Vice World News. So, so companies that have social at, at their heart. And we also see the same in the United States at the top there. Now this 5.5 million, the biggest on TikTok uh, that we found anyway. Um, but we also see big uh, broadcast networks very strongly represented there as well. Now, large follow accounts on TikTok is not necessarily a guarantee of success. So we also looked at average views per post on each account to get a sense of volume. Uh, and we've included in this chart um, brands from all 44 countries, not just Europe and the United States. So it gives you a real sense of where the volume is here. So at the top there, the numbers are better. <laughs> NBC News from the US, over a million views for every single post. Uh, Vice News, Vice World News, uh, over almost 700,000. These are really, really significant numbers now. Uh, many of the Brazilian brands are also uh, getting a lot of engagement. So we did this during the Brazilian election. Brands like G1, which is from Globo, uh, had sometimes 5, 6, 10 million views for a single uh, post about politics. Uh, and then other brands that were higher in the, in the earlier list of followers actually not doing so well. So sort of CBS News, for example, ABC News going down the list a little bit. So that's the, that's the big picture the big numbers, if you like. Um, but beyond that, what are the strategies that are being pursued by publishers? And broadly, we find two distinct approaches. So firstly, uh, we find creator-led approaches, sort of young people who are creating TikToks on behalf of platforms who understand TikTok, and they are creating bespoke content. 
And then you have a newsroom-led approach, which is essentially taking existing faces and content and distributing it across TikTok. So an example of the creator-led approach is uh, the Washington Post. This is Dave Jorgensen uh, with one of his, uh, the Washington Post TikTok guy, one of his trademark comedy sketches. This one was uh, to do with Halloween, and it was about shrink inflation, so sweet packets getting smaller. Um, and you can see the little girl being very disappointed. So there is, there is a bit of information going into this. It's not just uh, for fun. Um, and, it, and as Dave says, it's, it's because, you know, comedy is part of the DNA of TikTok. So he's really using a lot of that uh, and has done for many years now. But what's interesting in talking to the team, and it is now a team, there's three people, is that as the platform matures and audiences mature, there is more traditional news content, more news literacy content. So this was a piece for the midterms about why you should vote. Um, and the team increasingly has got involved with uh, debunking misinformation um, during Ukraine, for example. And um, you know, a part of their mission now they see as, as separating, helping people separate fact from fiction. Uh, another example uh, of a creator-led approach, um, this is a bespoke team, bespoke content at the LA Times. They call it a creator team. And it includes artists, filmmakers, cartoonists. They even have a puppeteer who creates um, a, a weekly series called The Sorry Report, which is being sorry about the state of the environment, these little one-minute uh, mini documentaries. Um, and then here in France, uh, Le Monde also has gone for this bespoke creator-led approach, uh, trying to translate news into a new language, essentially. So uh, here they're explaining, the mission is to explain, explain the differences between Shiites um, and Sunnis, for example, or how many countries uh, King Charles is now in charge of. So a young creator, uh, again, using drawing, using metaphors, very different kinds of storytelling. Okay, so, so then there's the second approach is the brand-led or newsroom approach. And this is illustrated by Sky News, for example, and many other broadcasters. Um, so their view is we have a lot of video. We have a lot of journalism. Uh, so why would you get a young creator to tell the story of Ukraine when we have Stuart Ramsey, who is on the ground, who can do that for us, and we can adapt his content? Uh, and this video got tens of millions of views uh, when, uh, when the invasion started, for example. For Sky News, the strategy is about four things. Uh, so firstly, eyewitness reporting. Secondly, being first with amazing pictures. So uh, if there are really strong pictures, um, then if you're second or third, then you don't get very many views. But if you are first, you really have the chance to go viral. Explainers, we've talked about those before, and then live broadcasts. So during the Queen's funeral, they had 16 million people on that live stream on TikTok partly because TikTok uh, created um, uh, notifications for it. And another example of the brand lab approach uh, that, that works is uh, The Economist. So The Economist famously doesn't have faces. It doesn't have bylines on, a, on its articles. Uh, the brand itself is the personality. And distinctiveness comes through um, the story, through the way they tell the stories, the brand qualities, also the hook. So they, they really start every video with, uh, with a question like, how did chickens get so big? And that one, by the way, I think now has five million, uh, five million views and counting. Uh, and then finally, um, the final approach is the sort of single correspondent or reporter. Uh, there aren't so many of these, um, but Max Foster from CNN has been there since uh, 2019. Uh, he has a million followers. That's pretty much the same as the whole CNN brand uh, and, and many other big brands that we saw earlier. So personality is really important. Um, many of his videos are very playful. Many of them are quite serious. Um, what happens to the Queen's Corgis got four million views, for example. And when talking to Max, he makes the point, you don't have to be young to, to do news on TikTok. And for certain types of things, uh, being older maybe carries a bit more credibility. So just to summarize, we have that sort of creator-led approach, and then we have that brand-led approach. Uh, we have some brands more at one end than the other, and then you have a traditional agenda, and then you have the more fun and entertaining 
approach. And what we have, without wishing to overgeneralize this, what you have is broadcasters tend to be in that top right space. So information-led, um, brand-led, because they have a lot of video, they have a lot of video assets that they can reuse and re repurpose. They have reporters on the ground. Uh, but they are also experimenting with different tones and agendas. Then you have correspondence, so, so generally informational, but again, some are trying that sort of lighter tone. Uh, then you have um, the socially native and, and sort of more upmarket newspaper brands, so they don't have a lot of video. Um, so what they're doing is a lot of experimentation or bringing new people in with new skills to create something that is truly distinctive. Uh, and then you also have a lot of popular brands that do celebrity news, but of many of those are also mixing that uh, with really good explain, explanatory content as well. So just a few tips. Uh, so how, how are you successful on TikTok? This comes from Actuality, uh, one of the most successful publishers. You remember one of their co-founders, Gabriella Campbell Gomez. Uh, so strong visuals, very important. Often combined with that first three seconds. Everyone talks about the first three seconds. You have to grab that attention. Uh, use simple language. That is their trademark. Be authentic, be authentic to yourself, be authentic to the platform. And then take some time to think about how the algorithm works. Uh, and the algorithm is based on engagement time and interactions, essentially. So a lot of that goes back to those first two points, strong visuals in the first three seconds. There's a little bit of difference about how often you need to post, but Gabriella uh, and Actuality are now posting six per week. So increase the volume. Uh, and the argument is the more you post, the more it's going to be shown to other people, the more chance you have to become viral. So just finally, looking ahead, um, as Chris said as well, you know, w this is still early days for TikTok, uh, and there are a lot of issues that publishers worry about. So I asked all of the interviewees, all the 20 interviewees, what should TikTok do to make this better platform for journalism? So firstly, they want, uh, they're really worried about misinformation on the platform, and they would like publishers um, to give them preferential treatment, if you like, for reliable news on, on the platform. So especially around issues like uh, elections or stories like Ukraine, find some way to prioritize the news that is most reliable. Uh, and that might include better labeling of different accounts. Uh, secondly, more transparency, uh, particularly around how and why TikTok remove content or when they apply warning screens ahead of sensitive material or difficult stories. So publishers argue that legitimate stories are being suppressed on the platform, often for good reason, because uh, TikTok wants to protect younger audiences. But reputable providers, they say, should be given more leeway. Uh, monetization is a huge issue. Effectively, there is no revenue currently for publishers, though there is a fund for creators. Uh, so there's no real option, and there's no real option to link out back to your website. So this, this is an even worse deal than Facebook and Twitter, effectively. Uh, and then publishers want better data on how content is performing so they can do benchmarks. Uh, other platforms basically are doing this better. So this is a pretty familiar list uh, for anyone who's followed platform stories over the years. And this is a kind of, in many ways, a new issue of the same issues where publishers have to balance short-term gains against long-term risks. Uh, so uh, hopefully that was kind of some interesting and useful data. The full report is out on Wednesday. It's available for free on our website on the Reuters Institute. Uh, so please do download it and you will find all the charts there. Thank you very much. Uh, five minutes of question and answers uh, with Nick Newman. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Yes, over there. Uh, sorry, we have to wait for the mic. Hi, how did, how did you choose who you wanted to interview? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think it was partly looking at which ones were most successful, um, but it was also trying to get a range. So I was trying to get a, uh, I wanted to talk to some 
creators who were really native to the platform and who'd been on it a long time, but I also wanted to talk to publishers who had only recently arrived on the platform to try and fully understand the range of, uh, of views. Um, and yeah, it, I, I think what surprised me actually was the, the reasons were pretty common for everyone, you know, those core reasons of trying to reach those younger audiences and experiment with, with, with new techniques. Uh, and I think one of the things that even the younger, even those socially native um, providers talked about was that um, that the platform is changing all the time. So what they thought was true at the beginning is not still true now. So so they're constantly thinking and learning uh, of what, what's what's been going on on the platform. Thank you very much. It's, it was really interesting. My question is uh, about the future of uh, journalism. What is, uh, in the TikTok world, what do you think? Is it going to be a fast journalism or a slow journalism that is very important about the truth of the news? Uh, you're asking me to predict the future of, of the most fast-moving mo um, uh, platform. I, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's really hard to know. So I think on the one hand, you know, people worry that uh, we're trivializing news. You know, how can you tell a story in one minute? But you have to remember that television news packages are now about one minute. <laughs> so, so um, you know, th there is some fantastic storytelling, some fantastic compressed storytelling, some fantastic explanatory storytelling. Uh, there's a real burgeoning of creativity on the platform, which really excites me as a storyteller, somebody who, who, who grew up, you know, doing journalism. Um, but I think the platform is also changing. So, uh, you know, it used to be a minute and now we're up to 10 minutes uh, or live as well. So I think, you know, as the platform develops, we're going to have the opportunity for many, many more experiences for, for depth uh, and detailed journalism. Some of, I mean, the New York Times was saying they're now producing, sorry, not New York Times, they're doing nothing. <laughs> the, the Washington Post are now producing uh, videos of five, 10 minutes and some of those longer videos are getting a lot more traction. So I, I don't think, I'm not worried about the dumbing down of it. Um, and I think we just need to watch this space. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Um, so you talk about like the rise of like a lot of these um, important like pre-existing news sites on the platform, but do you ever worry about like <coughs> Sorry, less credible like um, news organizations or individuals coming up and gaining that same influence through TikTok. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things we we looked at uh, last year in the Digital News Report was where people are paying attention in different social platforms. And in Twitter, people are paying attention broadly when it comes to news to mainstream news organizations and journalists. So people who've been through training and and have verification techniques within the process. What we found on TikTok, uh, this was 18 months ago was that people were, when it came to news, paying attention to influencers or celebrities. And we've seen many high profile cases during COVID, for example, where that spread disinformation. And, and I think uh, it may be different now because we're starting, to see, um, we're starting to see publishers going onto TikTok. We're starting to see TikTok also promoting some of those uh, publishers, particularly when important stories happen, like they did elections hub around the midterms in, in, in the United States, for example. So, um, but, but I, I, I looked at a whole load of creator content as part of this, and um, they're obviously not using the same standards, and some of them have more followers and getting more views than traditional journalists. So that is absolutely the challenge, and I think it's gonna be an increasing problem for TikTok this year. Thank you very much, thank you, Nick. Thanks. <laughs> We have just seen the top media brands with Nick Newman. Now let's focus on small media. And now our speaker is Francesco Zaffarano, senior editor, senior editor at DVX. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here talking with you about how small newsrooms uh, and media startups are using uh, TikTok. And if I get, yes, okay. Uh, so just a little bit about me. I'm a senior audience editor at DevX, which is a uh, online platform for the global community, uh, the global development community. 
uh, I'm not working on uh, TikTok projects right now, but I worked on social strategy for uh, the Telegraph, the Economist, La Repubblica, and La Stampa, so between the UK and Italy. And I was responsible for the launch of the Telegraph on TikTok, which uh, was the first broadsheet uh, newspaper uh, going on the platform in the UK. And I launched the um, a Will Media account on TikTok. Will Media is a new startup in uh, Italy. Uh, in 2019, I started mapping journalism attempts on, uh, on TikTok. This is a collaborative project to build basically a shared directory uh, of publishers on uh, TikTok. It's free and available on uh, a Google Spreadsheet. It looks very long because it's on loop, but it's still quite long. It started uh, with just 20 accounts and it's now uh, around 400. So if you want to do some research on uh, news on the platform, this is something you could use. And I understand that Nick used that for, uh, for his report as well. So I'm very happy this is being helpful for uh, people around. Um, so I did that because a few years ago in 2019, I started uh, reading articles like this one. Uh, so can TikTok say journalism? The Washington Post is set to find out. And everyone had a very clear idea, I mean clear, a very stereotypical idea of what TikTok was. So um, this mainly, dance, the dancing app. And suddenly everyone started thinking that being on TikTok as uh, a newspaper should have been just this. Which is fine. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I'm really a great fan, a huge fan of the Washington Post. But I was like amazed by the fact that we moved from just one idea, this, to this. So the only way of being on, of doing journalism on the platform was comedy, which again, don't get don't get me wrong, it's fantastic. But I don't think it's the only way you can be there. And so I started looking at other uh, examples from uh, many different uh, publications. And today I'm going to show you some examples of not comedy-based content from small newsrooms and media startups. And I think these are particularly interesting uh, like as, a, uh, as a type of um, media organizations, mainly because TikTok is a place that doesn't require uh, huge instruments and tools to uh, get going and to be out there and produce good, good content uh, that can reach literally millions of people. So let's see first what my previous uh, company uh, has done for the, the recent general election coverage. So we published uh, 90 seconds teasers of uh, the interviews that we did with our uh, with the party leaders uh, in our country, which is Italy. Um, so every, every single video was made of uh, a challenge. It was like, reply to uh, as many questions you can in just 90 seconds. And that was literally a part of uh, a bigger video with like the full interview with this, uh, with this candidates. So it was just basically a way to, to tease to a more in-depth content. Uh, then we publish explainers on how politicians communicate on social media. The guy that you see in the uh, in the little screen uh, at the top right, he basically talks through the whole video while pointing at tweets and posts on Facebook uh, to explain what are the techniques that that specific candidate is using to communicate on the platform. We produce explainers about the flagship reforms. Uh, for example, this was an attempt to explain what a flat tax is using pasta. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, I mean, of course, we are Italian, so we should, we should, you should use pasta to for this kind of stuff. And then educational videos on how to vote, because, like, of course, this was also a big election for many people who were uh, doing that for the first time. And on TikTok, of course, you can uh, reach them. So why not trying to get them to know how the, um, the polling system uh, works. This way, okay. Um, but it wasn't just a short form video. 
uh, we published like a, fi a five minutes video profile of the new prime minister after the uh, election. So this was an interesting uh, example because it was exactly the same video we published on YouTube. We simply repurposed it, uh, creating it in a vertical uh, format. So same depth, same uh, content, exactly the same tone of voice and language, a very huge su success. I think it was watched by more than 500,000 uh, people. And it has 33K uh, interactions, which is a lot. Uh, and on the right, you see, again, the same guy you saw in the previous, uh, in the previ in the previous slide, uh, but this time explaining what, um, what were the main topics um, covered by Giorgia Meloni, the new prime minister, in her first address to the uh, Italian parliament. But you heard about this publication uh, just a few minutes ago in uh, uh, Nick's um, speech. Uh, this is Actuality, the biggest publisher uh, on TikTok in Spain. Uh, they are mainly known for uh, daily news briefs uh, in uh, like just a minute, like five uh, stories of the day, but they also did uh, an interesting uh, experiment with uh, the, um, uh, the Ukraine war coverage, and they mix explainers, the one you can see on the, on the right of the slide. Uh, this is a, I think this is one of their most uh, watched videos ever, uh, with like millions, literally millions of views, on the reasons why the, um, the Ukraine war uh, started, I mean, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine started. And they also decided to go on the ground, on the border with uh, Ukraine, to report on the um, humanitarian aid uh, in the very first days of the, of the invasion. So not really comedy content, as you can, as you can see. But there's also Agencia Lupa, in Brazil. This is a very interesting publication for me. Uh, they are producing uh, just uh, fact-checking based content. They translate articles they produce for the website and they uh, make very short uh, videos out of them. Uh, they covered, for example, the Brazilian uh, elections with both fact-checking uh, videos and educational uh, content about the uh, the vote. So similar to what you saw earlier with Will Media, but in this case, it was mainly focused on those um, common mistakes around the voting system. So how can you vote without basically screwing up? <laughs> in uh, the UK and now very, since like just a few months ago, uh, also in the US, there is news movement. Uh, they produce both uh, on the ground reporting uh, interviews and explainers. The ones I added to the slides, I thought they were particularly interesting because of the format. There is no uh, person in this uh, in this video. It's just like a voiceover with a f this fast reading uh, effect on it. So very easy to produce uh, in terms of resources. Um, and I thought it w they were also interesting because some of their best performing content so far on the platform are all focused on the institutional crisis in the UK. Again, not comedy content. And I think this is the last one I have in the, uh, in the bunch, openly. I, I really, really like uh, this account. This is one of my uh, favorite accounts. Uh, not just because I'm LGBT uh, as, the, as the account is focused on, uh, but because they uh, produce uh, uh, they, they basically cover politics, lifestyle, and culture. They are just like two part-time um, uh, journalists working on this account, and they create very interesting uh, stuff, uh, both uh, explainers and reporting on the ground, but also a lot of very fun uh, viral-based uh, um, videos. Uh, on the news that are important and um, relevant for the LGBT community on a global uh, level. So these were very, just like 
a very quick overview of what uh, publishers are doing, uh, but I really wanted just to give you examples of how stereotypical the idea that TikTok should be just either dancing or comedy, uh, because there are many attempts out there to produce quality content on TikTok, especially when it comes to news. And we should probably, if you are looking into that, uh, either if you are doing that for yourself or for the organization you're working on, I think that looking, for, looking out for inspiration from these uh, companies can be very beneficial to your uh, strategy. I think that like three main takeaways that, that we can uh, get from these, um, from these uh, publishers uh, are that success on TikTok doesn't depend on trends. Like the vast majority of what you saw was literally had nothing to do with trending audio, with uh, dancing challenges. Of course they do also that because it's good to have that in the mix of content you produce. But um, it's not the kind of content that make them uh, grow and that uh, communicate to their audience their, that there is added value to what they're doing, apart from being like another account on the platform. Um, and I think that the, um, uh, that kind of success depends on the effort to understand the audience that is populating uh, the, pl the platform itself. So if you just go to, go to TikTok uh, and you just keep doing whatever you're doing uh, on any other platform without realizing what the context you are getting into, you will probably uh, not have the same level of success that these accounts are uh, having. Um, so second main takeaway, I would say, is exactly what I, what I mentioned like more than once already. TikTok is not just a dancing app. It's a multifaceted platform, and people gather there to spend their time and be entertained, of course, but this is exactly uh, what we tend to do with, for example, TV. And as Nick said just a few minutes ago, when we worry about trivializing the news, uh, we should probably think, why are we not just thinking the same when we think of news coverage uh, in broadcast news coverage? Uh, there could be the same kind of problems there. It's just that we are used to that. We, um, we found ways of protecting the quality of the content that we produce, and I, I'm sure we can do the same on this platform. We just, just a matter of not being scared of uh, a new challenge. And finally, content is uh, king, and as someone says, context is queen. Uh, make good journalism and think about the people you are making it for, because that's the best way, I think, to uh, be uh, as relevant and as valuable as possible. Uh, if anything of what you said in this presentation is of any interest for you, uh, you can keep in touch. Uh, you can check the mapping journalism on TikTok list I um, have on Google Spreadsheet. Again, it's free, and you can find it uh, on my Twitter account because, of course, I'm. Uh, I mean, we, we we are talking about TikTok, but my main platform, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, is still Twitter. Uh, and you can subscribe to the mapping journalism newsletter, which is not live yet, but it will be in just a month. So if you want to get it in your inbox, there's a QR code there, and you can subscribe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now it's uh, the turn of uh, Valeria Shashnok. She's a photographer. She's doing not only journalism, but also Emotional stuff, you will see. So, hi to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Valeria. 
and uh, I'm from Ukraine and I wanted to tell you my experience, like who I am, what was before the war, during the war and how changed my life. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No. Ah, you just... Uh, okay, so uh, you can see pictures um, of my life uh, in a bomb shelter. And uh, so um, war happened in Ukraine nine months ago. And I lived in a bunker for two weeks, uh, make videos for TikTok about Russian invasion. But uh, war in Ukraine happened in 2014 years, uh, 2014. But their full invasion happened nine months ago. And uh, just photo of uh, my, how I spent uh, my life here. And uh, so when I make uh, photos, videos, TikToks, uh, um, I, have, I started to have so many followers. Uh, and uh, I decided that maybe I can, w I can be so useful for my country. And uh, I started to collect money for volunteer organization in my native city, and we collect more than thirty thousand dollars, and we so and we spend this money on humanitarian help, clothes, medicines, because, uh, for example, old people can't get outside and buy medicine because you, I mean, you can't find medicine because people before buy it. Uh, and uh, it's my native city, Chernihiv. Uh, and uh, in the beginning of the war, I spent two weeks. Uh, I were, sometimes I can get uh, outside, go to my house, just to take something from, from my apartment. For example, clothes uh, or dishes, uh, like everything. Uh, and it was uh, so dangerous um, to take pictures uh, from these locations uh, because you never know when can a uh, bomb uh, got into near you. So yes, and uh, I mean, perfect example of con what can make sick person, I mean Putin, Russian president. And uh, also I wanna remind what uh, happened during this uh, nine months. Uh, uh, I think that maybe you know that the Russian Air Force bomb maternity hospital in Mariupol. It's subway where all people hide. Uh, it's because of the underground and it's one of the most safe place. And uh, Bucha, it was, uh, I remember that when it happened in Bucha, it's uh, near Kiev. I was in Europe, I already uh, go away from my native country, unfortunately, and I saw pictures from this location, and uh, I can't believe that in, mm, like in Ukraine, in uh, Europe, in 21st century, this, uh, this is really going on. And about politics in TikTok. So, uh, it's without sound. So, okay, it's a QR code for my TikTok, and uh, if you not follow me or just uh, don't know me, you can check everything. I show everything what uh, uh, happened. Uh, unfortunately, it's without sound, uh, but uh, it's uh, location, for example, close to my house. Uh, I'm so sorry that it's without sound. Okay, it's in Kharkiv, it's a city which close to Russia, uh, but in Ukraine, and uh, I, mean, I mean, it's maybe one of the most bombed city in my country, and uh, after that, during my experience politics in TikTok, uh, uh, European Parliament invited me, and I remember it was before my birthday, like one more once before the birthday, and I see an email from European Parliament. I was like, "What European Parliament? What I will do here? What I need to do?" And I was like, eh, "Okay, let's do it." Um, <laughs> And then Parliament declares Russia to be a state sponsor of terrorism. Honestly, I'm so happy. It's the best new. But unfortunately, uh, yes, European Parliament makes sense. It's one of the most uh, important like decision, and I mean the European Parliament. But uh, the more important decision, like the the person who are 
uh, can make a really important decision is USA, Biden, and uh, I hope that USA also accept it and uh, everyone waiting for that in my country. But anyway, it's something and just why I want to say that um, I mean, if Euro Europe support us, uh, I'm hope, I hope so that Russia or Russia, not Russia, USA also support us with that. And uh, the secret how to get attention in TikTok. Also, I want to say that uh, guys who was before me and explain everything, uh, how works TikTok, uh, I mean, it's, I really, it was really interesting to hear because uh, I just uh, write only four sentences, but anyway, it's also important, not so professional, but uh, nice quality of video, yes, it's so important. Short and simple title because uh, I, uh, honestly, I don't like to read uh, many, um, I don't like to read, unfortunately, on social media, and for me, but uh, fast, uh, short, uh, and so simple, and it's a really nice life hack how, how to get attention, like, so fast, like, you have once, only one second to get attention. Uh, trendy sound, I always used uh, for my videos, uh, even if it's a horrible situation, sometimes funny videos. And uh, I usually I make it with humor because uh, honestly humor is my protection and uh, it's easy how to, how to get attention from people my age or older then be confident about what you write or what you say. Because sometimes I'm really scared to write something about politics uh, uh, because you need to be really so clever in that. You need to know Ukrainian, not only Ukrainian history, but history also of different country to be kind to everyone. And uh, so really you need to be so confident. And uh, of course, never forget about the description. Uh, usually when I, even I post so funny videos, for example, like, haha, Putin bombed my country, very nice. Uh, but of course, no. Uh, I write, uh, I write 30% of power plants were damaged by Russian strikes. When I can, when can, when can I start enjoying li my life in my country? Or, or what would. Uh, also, I collected money for my uncle's house because it destroyed a Russian bomb and usually so <laughs> description is so important yes <laughs> and hashtag but uh, honestly hashtag can't make your video popular it's so useful when you are looking for I don't know for example for Ukraine or for clothes uh, everything and uh, I remember also that I was surprised that when I make so, so funny videos uh, and uh, journalists from CNN, BBC started to write and said, please, can you give an in, 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 interview for us? And I was sitting in a bunker. I was like, okay, what, uh, let, let's do it. But anyway, I did it because uh, I felt that I'm so useful in my, my country. I can tell truth. Uh, and uh, yes, I remember my father gave me so many advices what I need to say that we need military we need to to cancel Russia so and I also did it I say it every time when someone asked me and then it was also so strange that uh, one Austrian publisher decided that I need to write a book uh, about Russian invasion and we did it um, uh, in this book, I wrote about how can life change during the Russian invasion, how to continue to believe in a nice future. Uh, I, is this book in English, German, and Italian language? And uh, I wrote not on, is this book not about politics, but it's uh, my experience uh, during the war uh, because I spent only two weeks um, in a bomb shelter and then I go to another country, to Italy. It also was not a perfect period in my life. I mean, you don't have a house, you need to have money, you need to be, you need, maybe you need to find friends, work, etc., etc. So mentally I was just, uh, I, I just want to disappear sometimes and live on another planet. Yes, and it's the first uh, picture, uh, per first page of my book, uh, and uh, it's uh, 
like in the first day uh, when war happened, I of course I didn't believe because how can war happen in 21st century? And uh, first what I did is, oh, I wanted to visit market, uh, like grocery market near my home. And I remember no, no people, not, not, not no people, but not too much people, and uh, uh, this woman just uh, to sold uh, tobacco for cigarettes, and uh, she was like, you know, authentic, I, I really like it. And uh, um, Slava Ukraini. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we are looking over the practices of doing videos on TikTok with Sophia Smith Geller. She's senior reporter advice. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi euh, d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui et pouvoir partager mon travail avec vous. Euh, je suis désolée, mais je parlerai en anglais, c'est plus facile pour moi. Uh, today, I'll be speaking about my job, but I'll be doing a bit more than that. I hope that today can also, as much as it's a conversation about TikTok and journalism, be about where you are going to be if you're early in your journalism career and all of a sudden a new platform finds its way into your practice and what you choose to do with it, what the newsroom that you're working in chooses to do with it, and what you're going to do about that. Are you going to become an advocate in your newsroom for younger audiences, for digital audiences? Are you going to take a platform? Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to pretend it doesn't exist? Are you going to see what you can do with it? and see if it can not only be used as a publishing tool, but a news gathering tool. For me, in my early journalism career, it was TikTok. We don't know what it's going to be in a couple of years' time, uh, what I will need to pivot to, and what you will need to pivot to, too. So who am I? I am, by day, a senior news reporter at Vice World News. I am also a TikTok content creator. I made my first video either in October or uh, November 2019. So I was a fairly early adopter, but not the earliest. Washington Post had been on there, and I was a BBC journalist at the time, and a colleague of mine uh, did a sort of funny tweet saying, oh, Sophia tweeted the other day the BBC aren't on TikTok, so here's my contribution, and she made a TikTok, and then I made a TikTok to respond to her TikTok. And it was all kind of fun and games at the beginning, because my employer wasn't on it, Barely any employers were on it uh, in the news media space. And I was a video journalist. In the back of my mind, I thought, hmm, maybe one day I'm going to have to learn how to cut video for this platform. At the time, I was already cutting video. I think, I think it was um, vertical video for one platform, square video for Twitter or Facebook, uh, horizontal video for the website. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to add TikTok video cuts to that menu and that workflow that I have. Uh, it never occurred to me I would wind up to where I am today, which is over three years in, I have 350, uh, 450,000 followers, uh, and I've had over 130 million views. Over 100 million of those have been from my personal TikTok, and I think at this stage, it's sort of the 30 odd of them have been from the videos that I've created for Vice World News, who formally launched around January 2022 time. So it's nearly been a year for us on there. Uh, and I'm also an author. So like the few things that I'll talk about today, TikTok, being on TikTok and doing journalism on TikTok changed my life. Uh, but one of the things that led to was a book deal. So uh, it was one of the things that led to the book deal. So I wrote Losing It, Sex Education for the 21st Century about debunking sex myths. So let's go. So this is my timeline. So I put it here because you don't know what your timeline is going to look like uh, in your first, second, third year being in journalism. Uh, but when I look back, everything becomes very obvious. So everything that happened kind of makes sense when I sort of 
uh, look with hindsight. I was first a social media producer at the BBC. I had not trained to do social or digital journalism. I'd trained to do radio and television. So immediately I found myself in the kind of job that they give young people. Uh, a lot of you looking for jobs in the newsroom, uh, a lot of the ones that will be available to young people are the digital jobs because they think, oh yeah, you're young. You, you know TikTok, uh, you know Twitter, you know Instagram. Uh, I say seize upon that. If that's something that interests you, it's a way that you can get in and work your way up. A year into my career, I became a video journalist for the BBC World Service, which is the international radio station for the BBC English language. And I was their first ever and only visual journalist in faith and ethics. So it was about religion video. Uh, in my job interview, I pitched doing, I said the World Service needs an Instagram account and then I got the job and they were like, you know, in your job interview, you said we should be on Instagram. That's your job now. Uh, so then I, I did that. Uh, so be careful what you pitch for uh, in your interviews. I had a lot of fun doing that. In the first year, I got it to like 66,000 followers or something. Um, then I joined TikTok and then everything begins to change. So my outlet had only ever been the BBC before that. And suddenly I had an outlet of my own. Uh, from that first TikTok I made, it went viral. I had over 1,400 followers overnight. And it was just this kind of silly, funny, creator-led TikTok like we've been hearing about today that I created. And um, when you have... Who here has ever made a video that's gone viral? Mm. You're... you're oh, nice. You are, you're yet to experience, like, the glory. And once you do, you'll never look back. Uh, you need to get on there and you need to start having a bit of fun because once you have your first viral video, uh, an appetite is created and builds and you'll keep wanting to make more and more. Uh, I immediately started to build a following and I started to build it talking about everyday life as a journalist, but equally personal passions of mine, things I enjoy like languages or random facts that I learn every day. A lot of my content is not tied to my journalism. That's really important to me because it's how I keep happy and healthy. Um, my, my TikTok account isn't only about my job. It's also just about things I enjoy, my life. It's, it's a hobby of mine as much as it's become part of my digital toolkit. By April 2020, TikTok is helping me bring in stories for the BBC. I'm starting to generate news exclusives from being on there, uh, whether it's because uh, I had developed a relationship with TikTok at that point and I started getting stories that way, or my presence on the algorithm and on the feed meant I was finding stories on the For You page. At that point, there were so few journalists on there uh, that there were all these stories to mine because there simply weren't people looking out for them. At this stage, this was an app still getting a lot of things wrong, like we've, we heard earlier, especially from Chris. It was still very much... Uh, I remember one of my first stories for the BBC was this very racist trend that was going viral didn't matter how many people were were flagging it and reporting it it stayed up there uh, and that was one of my first stories showing how it wasn't protecting users by march 2021 uh, i had my first like proper viral moment of fame um a the ever given got stuck in the suez canal uh, and i turned that into a sea shanty so it was like a news explainer but to the tune of a, of a sea shanty uh, it had a million views in I can't remember how many hours, not many hours. Um, the next day, I was on the front page of Egypt's most read newspaper. Uh, I was on the biggest breakfast radio program in the UK, uh, all, with, all with something that I just did for a laugh. Uh, and I remember at the time, an email went round the BBC and my sea shanty was included in the section on competitors' videos. So even though I was a BBC journalist at the time, my own content on my personal feed was seen as, as competition. By September 2021, I had started getting so many stories via TikTok. I'd started really growing my, um, my, my portfolio, my byline, uh, and I applied for a job as a senior news reporter, and I definitely don't think I would have ever gotten it um, had I not created a community of report a community around my reporting that I begun as a BBC journalist and I've continued now as a senior news reporter at Vice World News. And this is where I am today. So uh, this time last year, I won a prize in the UK. The, uh, I won Innovation of the Year at the British Journalism Awards for my TikToks. And now I don't only make TikToks for me, uh, I make them for Vice World News. 
this is something that Nick mentioned earlier, and I just wanted to emphasize it now in the era of a post Elon Musk Twitter. I cannot emphasize how important it's gonna be for your career to be platform agnostic. Uh, I love Twitter, uh, all journalists pretty much do. It's, it's almost our natural habitat in the social media ecosystem, but that will not last forever. And crucially, it's not where audiences are. It's not where younger audiences are. And it's where traditionally older audiences and already news interested audiences are. If we want to make sure that trusted information debunks of misinformation and engaging content reach young people, as journalists, we need to lose our vice-like grip with Twitter and our, our obsession with it and, and amassing followers on there and nowhere else. Is Twitter still useful? Still useful for me day to day. Uh, but should you be thinking about being present on one or two or three platforms, I, I really could not recommend that enough. That's gonna safeguard you and the communities around your reporting that you build in the future. This is data from earlier this year, but the pivot to more YouTube, more TikTok, and I'd uh, add Instagram to this, and Instagram Reels has already begun. So newsrooms are really looking for people who have vertical video skill sets. And the beauty about that is that's something that you don't need kit to practice, to learn. All of you here could start a TikTok account or start uh, making more Reels on your Instagram account. Out of interest, how many people here have a TikTok account? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you use your TikTok for journalism? Everyone who had their hands up and put their hands down, everyone can put their hands down. Everyone who put their hands up and then put their hands down, you're using it. You, you know how much fun you have on there. You also probably know how much you're learning on there. Even if you're not actively making content, you have an idea of news appetite you have an idea about what people want. Uh, the biggest recommendation I can make to everyone is not necessarily get on TikTok and become a TikToker, but my advice would be know what people like on there. We um, have seen a, a, lot, a lot today about the difference kind of between brand and independent or correspondent accounts. Max Foster was raised earlier. I want to give you an idea of the kind of the different content that I make when I make content about journalism. These are sort of two hits that I had this year. The video on the right was seen 15 million times on Vice World News. Um, I, and I think it was seen that many times, not only for the subject matter, which was about catcalling at University of Madrid. Uh, I was the first really to cover the story in English, because it had only really been going around in Spanish news media. And then we were 100% the first to cover it in social video. Um, so earlier, uh, Nick mentioned that getting first to breaking news or explainer content can be extremely useful uh, because it will pay vast dividends. I also made, so I've started kind of, sometimes when I make a, a, Vi a TikTok for Vice, I then make a reporter's cut for my own uh, my own page, because we have different audiences. We've, I've got people who follow me who won't follow Vice, vice versa. And it's nice that it's my story. And as well as telling it in the, in the way that suits the Vice TikTok account, there's also a bit more um, sort of personal or kind of, I, I can deliver my own TikTok sometimes in a slightly different way. And I like to do that. So this one, yeah, I did my own, and that got 2.2 million too. So, and that, that was only on TikTok. The video overperformed as well on Instagram. It got well over a million views from memory. Um, the, the slide on the left is from uh, an exclusive that I had this year about a US anonymous US donor paying over 70,000 pounds to get to deliver anti-abortion talks in British schools. And it was a story that, it, it was a classic kind of mainstream media, don't think it's the most important news item of the day. But for young people in the UK, especially in a post um, Roe v Wade getting overturned world, this is a hot topic in the UK. It's something that young people care about, young women care about it especially. And my TikTok explainers about the story did so well 
that I had people duetting it. I had people sharing it. Um, and to, I was recently at a conference where I was telling someone about this story and they said to me, oh yeah, I know that story. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it was mine. And it transpired, they, they'd seen the TikTok and that was how they'd heard about it. So sometimes my own personal TikToks have helped my stories reach people that my own news platform, you know, the, the news website that I work for doesn't. So these are opportunities in which all you're doing is stretching out your toolkit and stretching out the prism of opportunity in which your content can reach people. It's all about having as many fingers and as many pies as possible, essentially. That's been my attitude. Here's a bit of a breakdown of the different kinds of content. A news explainer can be you explaining a news story that you have not necessarily written or done yourself. So that's an ex that is from the Suez Canal Sea Shanty. I don't tend to, to sing the news anymore. That was like a 2021 thing that I did, or 2020, I can't remember what it was. That was the old me. Now I'm a bit more serious. Uh, and um, that was, um, I did, that was another thing. There was sort of new sex research that had come out in the UK. It's not something that I'm gonna cover for Vice necessarily, because it wasn't sort of newsworthy or necessarily suited our platform, but I know that it suits my sort of community around my reporting that I've built. I made it and that video did very well. Uh, but you don't need to have written or originated the news story. It can just be you explaining something that's going on. However, that being said, I do create a lot of explainers around articles that I do. And what I sometimes like to do is bring in the Vice, like a screenshot of the Vice story, so people start to associate me with the Vice brand, because that's useful for me. Uh, and also, I do actively have to alert my followers to the fact I no longer work at the BBC and I still have a lot of people uh, who think I'm a BBC journalist sometimes on TikTok because they haven't yet realized I switched device. Um, then this is what I have had so much fun doing in my vice role. I, we were, are one of the first newsrooms that do vertical first deployments. So I will be sent to do text, you know, write, research, interview, and write up a text piece, but I will also be expected to self-shoot and edit uh, and create my own TikToks around that. Um, when you've been doing this for some time, you start to get a, a, a sixth sense about, oh, that'll do well. That's a good idea for a TikTok. Uh, there's a story that I've been following for some time, over a year. My, my very, one of my very first stories at Vice was all about Rossignano Solve and this, this beach in Tuscany. Uh, this toxic beach in Tuscany, and I'd been following the story, and I knew visually it was going to be so good because it's just this creepy beach. Um, and I got to go there, and that video did really well on both TikTok and Instagram. Really important moment to mention that if you do well on TikTok, you are also going to create good content for Instagram Reels. So two birds with one stone. And uh, this is another video that I made in the UK uh, about, uh, I went to Norfolk and a local council had planted something like over a thousand trees in a month where you're not supposed to plant loads of trees. Then there was a heat wave and guess what happened next? All the trees died. Uh, and I knew, wow, yeah, loads of dead trees. I was like, that would do really well. Uh, like visually, that's gonna look really good uh, because it's gonna shock people. Um, and interestingly, these are both environment stories. So I wanted to put them here because we, we hear a lot in the kind of climate, climate crisis journalism that it's really hard to, to engage people and get people's eyeballs. With TikTok, there is a way to tell the story. News gathering. This is an example of how being a TikTok channelist has delivered stories. Uh, the US election, I created a television and radio documentary for the BBC all about how TikTok was influencing the 2020 US election. Uh, when TikTok was going to be banned. You can see there I was asked to do a BBC explainer. Um, I found a uh, anti-Trump content creators being paid to make content and not disclosing it. Uh, and that led to a report into uh, political ads on TikTok by Mozilla. I, I essentially have a number of stories where I've caught people on TikTok doing something naughty before anyone else has. Uh, so that's, that's probably like a, a rich vein to mine. Um, that's an example, and it's brought documentary as well as other things. Uh, we've already heard from Valeria, who is a really incredible content creator who I've been following um, since she first started making videos about the war in Ukraine. Um, 
TikTok became such an important app for war content that uh, I, it was being a TikTok first journalist meant I was there first with a number of stories about that. So I was the first on the story that uh, Russia was trying to block TikTok. This was before TikTok kind of left the country, but um, I was the first on that. I was the first on uh, kind of looking at how creators who were against Putin felt completely abandoned. This was a, an angle being left out by other news media. And then these are a couple of other stories. Uh, one day, everyone was saying, oh, it's so good. TikTok is getting rid of all Andrew Tate content. Um, and it turned out a journalist had sort of misunderstood that. And the reality was, actually, there was a ton of Andrew Tate content on TikTok. And they had no uh, interest in removing all of the content. So I was the first on that story. Uh, and then this was a story I did earlier this year. And I will very quickly say, Chris mentioned earlier, you know, interactions with TikTok and the TikTok press team. Often, I will find problematic videos. I contact TikTok about it, ready to write a story. And often, those videos will be removed within a day. With this story, with both TikTok and Google, with YouTube, um, it took over a week for them to kind of figure out whether these videos were bad or not. One reason could be that their Arabic language moderation team isn't as big as their English language. Uh, and the other thing can be that they don't necessarily, like they probably don't have many people, if anyone at all, in their, in their companies that would know much about sex or gender misinformation. Um, so when we talk about misinformation crises and debunking it on TikTok, I urge you to think about what kinds of misinformation actually get prioritized there. It will be, you know, fairly rightly, COVID-19 misinformation, political election misinformation, but there's a ton on there that these platforms are not remotely capable of handling. Why is TikTok not for everyone? You might not have time for it. You might want more of a personal life. Uh, a lot of my personal life and like free time goes to TikTok. You might not want that for yourself and that's fine. Um, it might be that if your newsroom is not there supporting you, is it a smart idea to go on there? Should you advocate first for a supportive newsroom so that all of you can happily and healthily go on TikTok? That's another thing too. There will be a cost to your privacy and there will be a cost um, obviously in terms of online harassment. Uh, I've had to deal with quite a lot of that this year. So these are my little bits of advice. If you are a newsroom or one day you're gonna work in a newsroom, uh, one day you'll run one. If you wanna have TikTok journalists who are able to build communities around their reporting, not only in, in the auspices of their job, but also in their general social media presence, these are some of the things that you have to think about. Uh, and if you want to keep following me, I'm Sophia smith Gayler on TikTok, and I'm Sophia S. Gayler on Twitter and Instagram. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Serious but playful. Is that you? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And um, just a quick session of... Uh, euh, des petites places là pour recentrer au centre pour ceux qui sont sur les côtés et qui aimeraient bien s'asseoir. Ceux qui sont en bout peuvent se lever pour laisser les places euh, au centre, s'il vous plaît. Et puis pendant ce temps-là, Garance euh, Pardigon va pouvoir s'installer <rire> sur la scène pendant qu'on réaménage un peu les, les places. Garance Pardigon, elle travaille à TF1. Elle fait des vidéos sur TikTok. TF1, c'est la première chaîne en France. On ne les attendait pas forcément sur TikTok et elle va nous expliquer pourquoi ça fait partie de leur stratégie. Bonjour à tous. Donc, euh, moi, je suis journaliste pour le 20h de TF1. J'anime une chronique tous les soirs dans le, dans le 20h de Gilles Boulot, euh, du lundi au jeudi qui s'appelle « Le 20h vous répond ». En fait, ça correspond aux questions des... des enfin, je réponds aux questions des téléspectateurs. C'est au départ une chronique qui a été lancée pendant la crise du Covid-19, donc qui était dédiée à ça, aux questions que les gens pouvaient se poser sur le coronavirus et les confinements successifs. Moi, je me suis lancée sur TikTok un an après donc, le, le lancement de cette chronique à 20h pour plusieurs euh, raisons. D'abord parce que ma rubrique, elle reposait sur l'interactivité avec euh, le public et que les réseaux sociaux, d'une manière générale, sont quand même un, un très très bon moyen justement d'être euh, 
d'être proche des gens, de leurs interrogations, de leurs préoccupations. Euh, il y avait aussi, ensuite un enjeu euh, d'élargissement de l'audience, et j'insiste sur le mot élargissement et non pas rajeunissement, parce qu'on a très souvent tendance à opposer euh, la télévision et les réseaux sociaux en se disant qu'il n'y a que des vieux qui regardent le 20h et que des jeunes sur les réseaux sociaux. Et finalement, en étant euh, utilisatrice de cette euh, plateforme qui est TikTok, je me suis rendu compte qu'il y avait finalement pas mal de similitudes en fait, entre euh, les téléspectateurs de TF1 et euh, les utilisateurs de TikTok. Je m'en suis rendu compte notamment dans les commentaires qui sont euh, euh, très nombreux et extrêmement euh, interactifs sur TikTok. Et donc, je retrouvais... À, à peu près les mêmes personnes, tout en touchant parfois d'autres personnes qui n'auraient peut-être pas eu euh, le réflexe de regarder euh, un 20 heures parce que euh, ce n'est pas dans leurs usages, parce qu'ils s'informent euh, autrement. Et euh, c'est pourquoi ça m'a aussi permis justement d'aller vers plus de proximité. Et je dirais que c'est peut-être plutôt ça l'enjeu aujourd'hui pour, euh, pour une chaîne comme TF1, euh, plutôt que le rajeunissement de son, de son audience, dont voilà, on, on parle comme, euh, à mon avis, un, un bon vieux cliché sur la télévision, c'est plutôt la, la proximité et aussi casser un peu l'image du journaliste télé euh, que, euh, que, que, que le public peut avoir, et notamment, euh, là en l'occurrence, les jeunes, de se dire que Gilles Boulot est un, un homme tronc avec euh, un costume cravate qui est derrière son pupitre, euh, qui n'est pas très marrant. Euh, et ce cliché ne, ne s'arrête pas, à mon avis, aux jeunes qui nous regardent, mais, euh, mais à beaucoup de, de téléspectateurs. Et donc, TikTok nous offre le moyen, aujourd'hui, pour, pour TF1, de, euh, de casser cette image. Alors, comment Donc là, vous avez un petit exemple avec des filtres, parce que je suis une, une grande amatrice de, de filtres, euh, en l'occurrence Snapchat, que j'importe ensuite dans TikTok. Donc, euh, Gilles Boulot euh, joue le jeu avec moi. Donc là, en l'occurrence, on répondait à des questions de téléspectateurs sur le jubilé de la reine. Et il euh, faut imaginer un peu la scène. Moi, je, enfin, bon, je travaille tous les jours avec, euh, avec Gilles. Mais là, en l'occurrence, il faut quand même que je rentre dans son bureau, que je le toque à la porte et que je lui dise « Gilles, est-ce que tu serais OK pour porter un petit filtre de roi ?» Alors, tu vois, tu vas te retrouver avec, un, avec une couronne et un sceptre. Bon, et, euh, et tu vas devoir répondre à une question tout à fait euh, sérieusement. Donc lui, il se prête au jeu et euh, cette vidéo a fait euh, quasi, quasiment euh, 600 000 vues et euh, Gilles Boulot est devenu en fait euh, King Gilou sur les réseaux sociaux. Voilà, c'est devenu un petit hashtag. Et en fait, pour nous, euh, c'est pas du tout euh, quelque chose d'absurde ou de complètement insolite. En fait, c'est pour montrer aussi que, que Gilles, en l'occurrence, qu'on appelle euh, Gilou dans la rédaction, c'est euh, quelqu'un comme vous et moi qui... Euh, s'adresse aux gens, qui leur donne des informations, mais qui ne se, qui ne se met pas en fait, au-dessus de, de la mêlée et qui n'est pas seulement un homme tronc dans un poste de télévision. Donc ça, c'est le premier enjeu pour TF1. Je, 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 je resitue aussi le contexte, c'est que TF1 a ses propres comptes d'informations sur TikTok. On l'a vu avec, avec Sophia, il y a plusieurs façons d'être sur TikTok. Ce sont soit des comptes de médias, donc comme TF1, soit des comptes de de personnalité, ce sont les fameux créateurs, vous en avez déjà entendu parler, alors dans, ce, dans ce, cette grosse boîte des créateurs, il y a à la fois des gens qui font des, des bricolages et qui se filment chez eux, d'autres des, des, personnes qui vont faire des recettes de cuisine, et puis des, des, jour, des journalistes ou des gens qui dansent, voilà, donc on est, on est tous mis dans le même, sous la même appellation euh, créateur sur TikTok, et bon, vous allez voir qu'il y a une, parfois une frontière qui est un, un petit peu floue entre créateur et influenceur. Donc, dans quelle mesure un journaliste n'est pas aussi un influenceur de l'info Ça, c'est une question dont vous pourrez peut-être débattre tout à l'heure. En l'occurrence, moi, j'ai mon compte propre et je suis journaliste. Et ça, c'est quelque chose auquel je tiens. Parce que quand on est sur TikTok, on est donc mélangé à d'autres profils, mais on est aussi euh, mélangé à beaucoup de contenus de divertissement. Vous l'avez vu là aussi dans les, les présentations qui ont été faites euh, auparavant. Donc, moi, je m'appuie toujours sur l'information, sur les données, c'est-à-dire que le, la rigueur que j'applique pour répondre aux questions des téléspectateurs tous les soirs à 20h, c'est exactement la même rigueur euh, que j'applique pour mes contenus TikTok. Il n'y a aucune différence. Euh, et en fait, je décline tout simplement les réponses que je donne à l'antenne en format TikTok. Comment En changeant l'écriture et en adaptant euh, la forme. Donc, je vous ai préparé un exemple très concret. 
Donc vous avez euh, à gauche pour vous ce que peut donner la question euh, « Ma banque peut-elle clôturer mon compte du jour au lendemain sur un plateau de télévision ?» Donc euh, deux présentateurs avec euh, donc, euh, voilà, une, une posture de, de journal télévisé. Et de l'autre côté, la déclinaison TikTok. Euh, alors ce n'est pas la même écriture. C'est-à-dire que sur le plateau de, de TF1, moi j'ai 15, on va dire 20 secondes pour répondre à la question. Euh, évidemment, on n'est pas là pour, pour faire un exercice d'exubérance et d'extravagance. Il faut être précis, juste, bien sûr, ne pas faire d'erreur, être concret. Et ça, à la limite, ça va être exactement le même code sur TikTok. En revanche, sur l'écriture, pour décliner cette, cette réponse, j'ai en fait imaginé un dialogue entre un banquier et un client, et ça devient en fait une rupture amoureuse avec un, un banquier qui vous dit bah, « en fait, c'est fini, je te quitte ». Et le et client, donc il y a le, le cœur brisé, c'est évidemment quelque chose qu'on ne pourrait pas faire à 20 heures, mais finalement, l'information, elle passe peut-être de la même façon, c'est-à-dire que votre banque, elle a deux mois, elle peut effectivement clôturer votre, votre compte bancaire, mais elle a un préavis de deux mois et elle ne peut pas vous imposer de, de frais supplémentaires. Pourquoi est-ce que c'est important, en fait, de modifier la forme C'est que si moi, je me contente, en fait, de, de republier l'extrait du JT, je ne vais jamais faire, en fait, de, de vues sur TikTok. Très, très peu. Je ne vais jamais capter, euh, capter d'audience, de, 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 parce qu'en fait, ce ne sont pas les codes de cette plateforme. Donc, se lancer sur TikTok, ça implique une nouvelle écriture journalistique. Et euh, c'est ce que, personnellement, je trouve extrêmement intéressant euh, dans cet exercice. Donc moi, j'ai inventé plusieurs types de formats. Donc il y a à la fois bon, ces, ces dialogues euh, voilà, entre, entre bah, moi-même, entre deux personnages. J'ai aussi inventé des petits, euh, des petits tops ou des petits flops. Donc ça va être euh, les cinq, euh, là, enfin, bon, qu'est-ce qui consomme le plus d'électricité chez vous Cette vidéo, elle a fait plus euh, d'un million de vues. En fait, je, je, bah, je, je décline donc cinq, euh, cinq appareils électroménagers. Et à chaque fois, j'utilise un filtre Snapchat différent pour euh, montrer euh, ces, euh, ces appareils électroménagers. Donc je me retrouve euh, sous forme d'assiettes sales, euh, ensuite de, euh, de lave-linge. Euh, Il voilà. ne faut pas avoir peur en fait, de, non plus euh, du ridicule pour euh, se lancer sur cette plateforme. La, la... Donc je, vous dis mon... enfin, je vous communique mon enthousiasme par rapport à ces, cette nouvelle écriture journalistique que j'adore euh, expérimenter, et parce que TikTok est un champ de création euh, quasiment infini. En revanche, mon seul regret ou ma seule petite, on va dire, nuance, c'est qu'il faut garder un équilibre très strict donc, entre information et divertissement. Et ça, ce n'est pas forcément une mince affaire sur TikTok parce que vous êtes donc mélangé à, à des contenus de, oui, de divertissement et que parfois, vous allez passer beaucoup de temps sur une vidéo qui explique des choses très importantes. Donc là, par exemple, ce week-end, j'ai fait une, une vidéo sur la milice Wagner qui euh, fait circuler, donc la milice Wagner, un, un groupe paramilitaire euh, russe, qui fait circuler des, euh, bah, des contenus, justement, de propagande sur les réseaux sociaux. Cette vidéo a fait 4000 vues, ce qui est un énorme flop pour TikTok. Moi, j'ai 170 000 abonnés, donc quand j'ai 4000 vues, en général, je ne suis pas très contente. Et à l'inverse... La vidéo de mon compte qui a été plus vue est une danse avec Evelyne Delia sur le plateau du JT qui a fait 4 millions de vues. Donc vous voyez, parfois pour un journaliste, ça peut être un petit peu euh, frustrant. Cependant, je ne perds pas espoir parce qu'il y a parfois donc, des, des vidéos comme, comme celle-ci sur la consommation euh, d'électricité ou encore euh, des vidéos pendant la campagne euh, électorale sur la différence entre le vote blanc et le vote nul qui ont fait plus de 2 millions de vues sur mon compte. Donc on voit que ce sont des, voilà, des sujets qui ne sont pas forcément faciles à, à, à porter et qui là ont, ont touché beaucoup de personnes parce que moi mon but c'est simplement d'informer le plus grand nombre. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Après la France, euh, prenons un avion, même si ce n'est pas très écolo, pour aller jusqu'en Asie avec Dana Raj Keo Kao, Welcome on Stage, qui va nous raconter la puissance de ce marché pour TikTok.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, what is it? Danaraj Kielkao from Thailand. Uh, to be honest, I have to admit that I'm perhaps one of the outside person in this room. I'm not a trained journalist. I'm actually a lawyer, but I have conducted, I have been involved with the media for for quite some time, and I've been uh, the program coordinator for Asian Network for Public Opinion Research since 2012. And we have done a lot of collaborations with colleagues all over Asia to conduct uh, public opinion surveys. And among of our topic involve journalism and mass media. And this is why uh, we have been lately invited by the Oxford Reuters Institute to report the case of digital news media from Thailand. And from that discovery, we have done uh, successive uh, research or surveys based on the information, which uh, many of us knows TikTok is something big. I think it's the same phenomenon every corner of the world. But we want to understand why, why particularly our region. So if you looked um, from, the, from TikTok itself, has, it has reported Southeast Asia is among the biggest active user of TikTok, interestingly. First comes for our region is Indonesia, comes as the second on the top 10, Vietnam on the sixth, and the Philippines on the seventh, Thailand on the eighth. Can any of you perhaps hint or guess why that is the case? Some hands, please. The question is, why do you think Southeast Asia, at least four countries, has become one of the active TikTok users? Some hands, please. Yes, please. Where, uh, that is one of the reasons, yes. Please. You're going to that direction. Uh, in fact, for many of the countries in the Southeast Asian region has been known in political science as also authoritarian regimes. So in, in some form, uh, censorship from the state remains very high in contrast to European societies. TikTok being fast, very fast, has been somewhat difficult for the government to restrict. So TikTok is another channel, but I do not say that it's uh, proper or reliable. And it's like in many places here in Europe, it involves a lot of um, fake news as well. But it is a channel. Every channel for any uh, authoritarian regime, for, uh, people living there, is a good way to express themselves. And primary targets, the same as TikTok philosophies, uh, around about 70% of users in, in Southeast Asia are indeed these two generations, the other remaining somewhat older. But interestingly, you will find more and more older generations swiping TikTok. If you go to the market, to rural areas, you will see people swiping through that. So I bring to the question, why? I try to grab up. According to TikTok itself, the head marketing of TikTok says their app has been something fun. It is about making jokes, and people can express them easy. And TikTok has been able to do so for the Thai or Southeast Asian uh, users. And according to Oxford Reuters Digital News Report, uh, Thailand has in fact been the highest active uh, TikTok user and as well as a news uh, receiver. And this is because it contains lighter and um, entertainment base. Another reason is that Thais or Southeast Asian people prefers listening, watching, 
rather than reading. If you commute on the train here in the TGV or the German ICE, you'll see French or Germans carrying books. You don't see that in Southeast Asia. <laughs> you'll see people holding mobile phones. They either go on TikTok, Twitter, or YouTube, or Facebook Live. But I guarantee you, if you bought a flight on Thai Airways to Bangkok, you'd never see an Asian face holding a book. <laughs> that I guarantee. I just arrived yesterday, so I, I know how that feels. And to be honest, I myself have to admit that kind of uh, feeling as well. Um, so let me try to... Actually, the slides is a little bit old. I have a revised version, but it seems not to be here. So let me grab you some ideas. So basically, from our follow-up studies of the Oxford report, we have found that there are actually four uh, reasons why TikTok itself has been growing, especially for news. First reason is the app itself. As I said, it's fast, easy. Second reason is the censorship, which I think some of us will be discussing. It provides the, the access. Uh, the third and the fourth reason is something people in Europe may have slipped their eyes through. The third reason is being long transit. People, if, you, if I may go back to these four countries in Southeast Asia, People spend le no less than one hour of commuting. What does it mean? It means people sit longer on their mobile phone. I, I told you earlier, no one reads. And it's also difficult to read on the bus or on the train or while driving. Even though you're not allowed to, to use your my mobile phone while you drive, because the traffic is so bad, people sit in the car for so long, you kind of Oh, there's another one minute. And TikTok itself, as colleague here has rightly mentioned, it's only three seconds. So a one minute break from the light allows you 20 swipes or 10 swipes. So because of traffic, people go on mobile phone. And because, tra because TikTok is so fast, you can go on TikTok more than any other apps. So. That is what we have found out from our focus group, and this result has been somewhat amazing. We never thought of that. Uh, the last, uh, fourth reason we have encountered is that mobile packages, mobile data, or your subscription is somewhat cheaper in Southeast Asia. If you spend around about 18 euros or 20 euros per month uh, on a contract, you get unlimited 5G internet. Whereas in Europe, you are spending more than this, I believe. At least for 5G, it's around about, uh, in Germany, it's about 40 euros, whereas in Thailand it's, or in the region, it's only 20. So basically, people has the ability to go online, to download heavier content, uh, regardless of, of what that it, uh, if that would be YouTube, or that would be Facebook Live. So now we look at the, the prospect of journalism. Astonishingly, we have tried to look up all the official channels. Every news agency in Thailand is on TikTok, either as official ones or, or most of them are official ones. And the reporter themselves are very active in TikTok, like uh, two previous colleagues who has presented. So everyone has been on TikTok. Being, being on TikTok also means that Thais are becoming more and more associated with TikTok and having higher confidence. So basically, you said, or everyone has been saying all over the world, that fake news is heavily associated with TikTok. But the more official channels become involving in the TikTok, meaning the mainstream media as well has been able to provide 
a good journalism. Hopefully, they are not influenced, but most of them, if we take the assumption that every news agency are reporting not so fake news or reliable news, it would also mean TikTok would be their second screen on, on the system as well. A third reason we have found, to be honest, I'm not an not a IT technician, but every respondent has said TikTok Live is a lot better than YouTube Live, than Facebook Live. In fact, I sent a link to my colleagues in Thailand, and a lot of them are listening in Asia. Everyone has been a bit, hey, Dana Raj, are you sure that the event is taking place? Because the signal is very bad. The video and the voice doesn't match. And that is really the fact. But I cannot explain this why, technically. So uh, a lot of younger generation has indeed been viewing the program from TikTok Live. But as the results from Nick from Oxford, unfortunately, the engagement level of the Thai uh, to, uh, TikTok user is somewhat less. So Thais are good audience, but not so active uh, people uh, as an engagement. So what happened in Thailand is like what happened here too. A lot of colleagues have been mentioning about uh, direct reporting. The journalists themselves have been able to explain the news or shed ideas on the news beyond the availability of the news agency. So basically, it's a kind of mobile journalism. It extends the arm of the news agency. And being able to direct report means the gatekeeper of the information is no longer uh, necessary or, or it has overridden the whole process. So making the news faster to, to the audience. What it means or the implication for the news agency is basically every new a news agency in Thailand has been a trying to adapt themselves by putting short headlines so that the attention comes to the audience very quick. I will show you later what kind of pattern has emerged from our focus group. And also, as our colleague here earlier mentioned about the participation, like for example, from the Ukraine, there are indeed growing number of journalists or informal journalists. So it makes this kind of journalism, if I may name, a hybrid journalist hybrid journalism for both news agency and the news agency itself has to adapt. Otherwise, uh, it will be difficult for them to survive. They cost money. One important fact is that the remuneration or the income from TikTok, I can confirm you this, no app will stay. TikTok, if they don't find ways to make profit, not for them, for everyone, TikTok itself will come to an end. And what we have been discussing here will end in a two year span. So we have to look how TikTok will change itself, how it will develop itself in a way that content creators earn money. The viewer has the opportunity to become a content creator or, or to earn money. Otherwise, TikTok will be uh, like old websites. It's, it's a hype for a short while, and after that, it, it suddenly declines. Facebook is a good example, or YouTube is a good example. It started well, and it's, it has been staying for a while. And the reason why it has been staying is because it can generate income. And this area in TikTok has been a bit unclear. News agency has, in our focus group, a number of news agency has been claiming that they have been able to generate income through participating TikTok, either as product placement, because Thai uh, producers are creative. They simply use famous programs, which has a good product placement behind their, their segment, uh, everything. 
even what they wear, what they put on the table. So everything like that has been enabling the the producers to at least extend their ways to make money. So a number of of channel has acknowledged that, although we cannot quantify to what extent or how much do they earn per per TikTok usage, but but it's something to look forward. And as everyone here seems to be from the journalist uh, perspective, trust me on this, uh, it will be a phenomena which you have to observe. So as I'm here in France, uh, I'm, I'm from Thailand, perhaps one way to bring you to an attention how or what we have discovered is by comparing food. Both uh, culture has been famous for food, delicacy. So consuming news, consuming news is like consuming food. If you travel from England, an English broke would come to France and say, oh, what is that? It's, uh, it's a snail. Or someone from South Germany. I lived in South Germany for a very long time. I studied there I, um, as an exchange student, and I know that people there don't try to... They are afraid of something exotic more than beef, pork, chicken. So if you in, uh, invite them to try oysters, they would hold back. If, if you invite them to try escargot, they would hold back. So, so they, they would be afraid. Same as news consumption and what we have found. Every respondent, especially the younger generation, says what they make is that they use TikTok as an appetizer. What, that's, what that means is basically they tune on. Younger generation follow this pattern. They tune on their smartphone. They use some swipe. Okay, what is happening? Is there a fire? Is there a war? Well, I'm not interested. Shut off. Uh, I just knew this trick from my student at the university. I asked them, hey, I know that you guys don't like heavy news. They like entertainment. What do you do when TikTok keep uh, bringing you heavy news? They say they just uh, stop the app and restart again, and somehow the algorithm would bring them to a new start. I said, I have no clue at all how that works, but okay, I'll take that for granted. Uh, so basically, Thai younger generation has been using TikTok as a platform to see what is going on in their interest. That would be news or, or, or light entertainment or news or fashion or anything, they use that as an appetizer. If they don't like, they just put it out. Like Thai food. If it's too spicy, you first you take first bite and say, oh, it's too, too spicy, I don't take it. Finish. But if they like it, I ask them, what do you do? And in our study, we have found that they simply stop using TikTok. They say TikTok provides only skim of the idea, skim of the news. And then I asked them, many su suggested that if you want to look further, they look on YouTube. I asked, why don't you Google? They said, well, I'm too lazy to read. They're too lazy. So basically, the main cause would be something like YouTube. They go on YouTube, listen for 10 minutes, five minutes. Uh, hopefully there is, there are some good uh, programs showing them more details and then if they feel the YouTube doesn't uh, fulfill their expectation they need to know more they want to look at statistics they want to look at the photos they want to look at alternative discussion they then go to Google they then go to the website they then go to the news agency uh, reporting itself so this pattern of news consumption is indeed 
happening in Thailand. And I believe this is also happening in Southeast Asia and probably becoming more and more in Europe. So unfortunately, I've tried to come out with uh, courses of menu to give my French audience uh, a good comparison. Unfortunately, I have to leave the dessert for our colleagues presenting after me to come up with uh, other answers. Now, if we look ahead, what would happen in the future? So TikTok has been adapting itself. There is a new app started only like two months ago, TikTok Now, which associate TikTok in general and TikTok uh, Now is more like a Facebook of TikTok where you can connect your, your friends. So we have to look forward how that develops. Um, if any other market has more and more formal or official sources on TikTok, I believe the same phenomena will happen as in Thailand. So basically, less fake news or hopefully more reliable news. So it is important that news channel, news agency in Europe should participate more on, on TikTok. Third, thirdly, is that what happens in Thailand is that the license for digital TV has been somewhat expensive and digital TV has been somewhat costly. A number of digital TV is unable to provide sufficient income to sustain their production. So uh, TikTok being another second screen would be a good opportunity for uh, digital broadcaster or normal broadcaster to engage on more uh, is there a question? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, just to continue? Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So the decline of digital TV has been part of the cause or could be a way to move on with TikTok. Fourthly, advertisement. As I've mentioned earlier, the ability to make advertisement somehow, some way, on TikTok would be a good resolution for, for any news agency or producers. So our studies shows that charges will be scary for TikTok user. Imagine if you remember the days, the early days of YouTube. YouTube was something very special. And then uh, people fear that one day there will be cost or too much advertisement. And access to internet package would impact the, the usage. So I think I give you an overview from Thailand. Thank you very much, and Kapun Krab. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Maybe you can go just now? after, yes. uh, because we are running out of time. Yes. I'm so sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you again. Now let's go in the US again with uh, Brandi Gerkin. Uh, she's a senior policy fellow at Mozilla Foundation. She will talk about the midterm election. Thank you very much. Hello, bonjour. Um, my name is Brandi Gerkin. I am a senior policy fellow researcher and advocate. I've been working with the Mozilla Foundation with some of my colleagues there over the last three years or so to study um, political influence on TikTok um, and TikTok's response to it in several different countries and electoral contexts. And I want to talk to you today about how political influence and mis and disinformation are still happening on TikTok, happening in very different ways on TikTok than we see on some other social media platforms. But before we dig in on TikTok, I wanna give you some context behind uh, mis and disinformation on social media platforms more generally. So the story begins kind of around 2016 when 
the conversation around myths and disinformation on social media really became mainstream. Um, these are ads that were placed on um, Facebook by Russian disinformation agencies. We also have the Cambridge Analytica scandal. This was really when this conversation started to kind of take hold. And it took a few years, but around 2018 or so, is when lawmakers, policymakers, really started to pay attention to this problem on social media and tried to be pushing social media companies um, to be more responsible and do more to combat mis and disinformation on their platforms. Um, they did this through developing more mechanisms for advertising transparency and verification to ensure that things like this didn't continue to happen. Um, also upping their content moderation workforces and policies. One such regulatory initiative took place um, here in Europe through the development of something called the EU Code of Practice on Disinformation, which is a self-regulatory uh, voluntary code that was developed by social media platforms alongside the European Commission to commit to taking certain actions to combat mis- and disinformation on their platforms. So where does TikTok come in? TikTok, it's an interesting platform in that they were a bit later to the game, which means that they could sit back and watch what was happening in comparison to some of the other social media platforms. We heard Chris talk about how that led to them learning from some of the mistakes, but it also, learned, it also led to them being able to rebrand themselves as a social media platform and say, we're going to do things a little bit differently. So um, TikTok have hired a lot of lobbyists, a lot of policy folks from other platforms to join their team. Um, and one of the big statements that they made early on was, we are not a platform for political advertising they completely banned political advertising from the platform, which is an interesting approach that is quite different from what other major platforms um, have done. So that's interesting because when a platform throws out the playbook, it begs the question of, okay, but then what are you going to do differently in terms of responsibility, in terms of accountability? If you're saying there are no political ads allowed on the platform, how is that policy going to be enforced, upheld, monitored, et cetera? It's also interesting because TikTok is a primarily video-based platform. And I also study YouTube. Video is harder, much harder from a content moderation perspective to deal with than platforms that prim uh, rely primarily on, on text or even audio. And the third reason it's interesting is because it is very hard to study TikTok. It is very hard to get data about TikTok um, from the outside perspective. So funnily enough, um, that EU code of practice on disinformation that I was talking about. Uh, in 2020, TikTok was like, yeah, we want to join that. And so this is um, an example from actually the commitments that uh, TikTok made. You can see on the third one here, this is what they submitted to the European Commission. Uh, around political advertising transparency, they said, this is not applicable to us. We don't allow political ads. However, we heard from Sophia earlier, uh, what we, her reporting actually inspired a lot of our work on this, um, that there indeed were influencers who were being paid by political organizations in order to disseminate content and influence. There were reports from The Guardian that were showing um, influencers were being approached by Russia-linked PR agencies asking them to spread disinformation about COVID vaccines. So there was a lot happening on the platform that may have looked different than what was happening in 2016 on Facebook where these ads were being bought and placed directly through the platform, but nevertheless, the tactics around disinformation and the intent behind it was very much there. So we decided to dig in further and we actually made a TikTok <laughs> about our, uh, our research findings. So I'll try to play it, see if the audio works. I think the audio doesn't work. <laughs> oh. 
That's okay. I'll explain to you more about what we found, uh, and you can find the TikTok. I'll share our, our handle um, a little bit later. So our first finding um, was that many um, TikTok influencers in the United States across the political spectrum who disseminate a political message on the platform were also receiving payment from political organizations. So in our research, we defined payment as financial compensation, complimentary gifts, or trips. So I'll, I'll also share this one in follow-up. Um, this is a TikTok from somebody, you can see it um, already on the, the text, who is talking about her day in the life as a political influencer. So this idea that folks are actually branding themselves as political influencers um, on the platform. And again, we found this on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States. Some of the funding could also be characterized as dark money, which is political spending that is aimed at actually influencing voters, but whereby the source of the money or the donor is not fully disclosed. So these were posted to TikTok without disclosure about who was actually paying influencers to post this content. The, oh, I think this one's not gonna play. The second thing we found was that TikTok doesn't seem to effectively monitor this advertising. So what this is, we used an unofficial uh, TikTok API to query the platform, and you can see in, it highlighted in gray that TikTok actually uses an attribute called isAd. So what this means is that internally, TikTok labels certain TikToks as ads and certain TikToks as not ads. We looked at the, uh, the TikToks we found, which were paid for, influencers were being paid by, by political organizations, and found that they were marked, is ad, is false. Why does this matter? It matters because if TikTok is not labeling this content as advertising, it means that they can't have a way of actually tracking it, of actually seeing, does this violate some of our policies around a complete ban on political ads? So, after we released that investigation, TikTok actually introduced um, a branded content toggle, so a toggle that allowed influencers to disclose if their posts were being paid for by a brand or you know, um, otherwise. But we knew that, particularly around elections, there was likely to be a lot of political influence that was just flying under the radar on TikTok. So some of my colleagues, um, Becca Ricks, uh, one of my colleagues, Becca Ricks, teamed up with a German journalist called Marcus Bosch, and together they ran an investigation um, looking into the um, German federal elections in 2021. And they found that TikTok, uh, TikTok's efforts to prevent mis and disinformation had sort of mixed results. So this is an example of two, uh, two political party accounts on TikTok. You can see here that there is inconsistency in terms of the labeling on these TikToks. So there's a little gray, dark gray box underneath each of these TikToks that directs people to authoritative information and news sources about the election, but you can see here that it's very inconsistent in terms of when those banners are actually applied. We also uncovered several TikTok accounts with significant followings that were impersonating prominent German political institutions and figures um, with, with huge followings just days before the election, for example. And we went on to continue one of my colleagues, Odanga Madung, who is a Kenyan researcher and journalist, um, looked, at the Ken looked at TikTok in the Kenyan political context during this year's election and identified over 130 TikTok videos um, featuring hate speech, incitement, uh, and political disinformation, um, particularly along ethnic lines, which uh, is, is incredibly problematic in the, the Kenyan political context. Um, collectively, these videos had amassed millions of views, and many of them breached TikTok's own um, terms of service, community guidelines, and, and policies. So um, here are some 
handles where you can follow our work on Mozilla's work on this and also the colleagues who I've mentioned uh, who continue to sort of monitor TikTok from the outside. But in summary, the points that I want to leave you with are that firstly, political influence is happening on TikTok. The platform tends to really try to brand itself, particularly in the policy and the regulatory space, as a platform um, that is not very much for politics, that is for inspiration and creativity. However, um, novel techniques for influence, such as paying influencers to spread disinformation, are going to be and are tested first on TikTok. That means that folks who are studying this from the outside, who are trying to you know, get out information about what is happening in politics to the public, need to also be on TikTok and need to be taking a different approach with studying TikTok than the playbook that's worked for other platforms. The second is that there is a really significant role for civil society, for journalists, for activists to be monitoring what's happening on TikTok, particularly around elections. Um, and to the third point, we're going to have to work together, I think, to do this because TikTok is really difficult to study. The platform has not made data available or tools for researchers and journalists in the way that other platforms have, which means that there's kind of a underground group of people who are trying to work to get data available and out there for folks who are doing this kind of research and investigative reporting from the outside. Um, so I'm really happy to speak to anybody who is interested. We've had really good success teaming up with journalists to do some of these investigations, um, but about some of the research methodologies that we've used to, to study the platform. Um, so feel free to, to write me or to, uh, to find me on Twitter if you're, if you're interested in any of this. And I hope that you learned something about mis and disinformation on TikTok. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you stay on the chair for a few few minutes of question, if it's possible? Because we have a, a little issue with the next speaker. So if you want to raise your hand, if you have uh, any question for for Brandy, can you raise your hand? OK, Andrea, ici. Hi, so yeah, my question was about um, like the Mozilla Foundation's work and like I was really curious like what kind of different competencies are required to kind of do an investigation like this. Like I imagine it's something that's very multi-disciplinary, uh, so I was mm -hmm. kind of curious um, like is this, is this more of a thing for engineers or journalists or is it, I guess it's something where a lot of different professions are working together, so kind of yeah. curious. Yeah, good question. Um, it pretty much involves I think some um, data science capacity, whether that's working with a data journalist or whether that's teaming up with organizations that collect, that scrape data from TikTok and then make it available. Uh, so folks who have uh, sort of experience in that and then policy and advocacy. So alongside the investigations that we've run, we're not you know, our goal isn't to just put out, hey, this is what's happening, but also make recommendations and work together with the platforms to discuss what they can do to be more responsible. Um, and then I would say the other big one is probably communications and making sure that this work gets out to the right audiences. So that was kind of what our teams working on this looks like. Yeah, but there are, like, like I was saying, there are groups that are trying to make more data available in a format that it could just be parsed through um, by, you know, people who are looking for a, a good story within the context that they're working in and a story that needs to be told. So um, it varies in terms of the, the tools that are available to sort of make data presentable in a way that, that different people can understand. One more question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Nous avons un petit problème de connexion avec euh, Karen Ho, donc euh, je vous propose qu'on aille euh, sur notre nouveau chapitre, c'est sous le capot des algorithmes, avec Guillaume Chalot qui est en train de s'installer. L'idée c'est vraiment de regarder un peu plus sous le capot de l'algorithme, euh, à la fois de YouTube et euh, de TikTok, et de voir les points de ressemblance, les points de divergence. Guillaume Chalot qui est un ancien ingénieur de Google, le, fond, le fondateur de algotransparency.org va vous raconter ses découvertes. Hello everybody. So I'm also a bit of an outsider because I'm a techie and yeah, we have a lot of journalists here. Uh, but I think it's interesting to dive into how the algorithm is because the algorithm controls the platform uh, and I'm going to show you how it works. Uh, so I did my PhD in AI at Maastricht University, then I worked at Microsoft, Google, where I worked on the YouTube algorithm, and then I was a Mozilla fellow, like uh, Brandy. Um, and now I'm working at uh, Perrin, which is a center with uh, technical expertise on platforms uh, at Bercy, but I'm going to talk in my own name, uh, so I'm not going to talk to you about the research we're doing there. So every opinion is just my own. Uh, I participated in two, two investigations into TikTok, uh, one uh, by the New York Times, where they had some internal documents that they asked me to review uh, about the function, uh, how the algorithm works, and uh, one by the Wall Street Journal that studied um, filter bubbles uh, on TikTok, uh, on in particular, toxic filter bubbles like depressive, uh, content that push you to su suicidal uh, thoughts, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so how does the recommendation AI work? <clears throat> so first, at YouTube, it controls more than 70% of the views. And on TikTok, nearly every views come from the AI. So, So the AI, um, how, how does it work? Uh, it's, it's actually pretty simple to understand when you understand that it has a goal. In technical terms, we call this goal the loss function. So each AI, if you understand its goal, you can really understand where, what it's going to do. Even if it's very smart and it has a lot of data and it can do some very complicated things. So for instance, the goal we set in the AI of YouTube was to try to maximize watch time. Why? Because if you have more watch time, then you have more opportunities for advertisement, and so you have more ad revenue. So basically, if you optimize for watch time, the conclusion is that you're going to have addiction by design. So these things are also true on, on TikTok. And what's the big difference uh, between TikTok and YouTube? The big difference is that when YouTube uh, started optimizing for watch time, it favored longer videos uh, because longer videos were creating more watch time. So all these small videos that you had initially on, uh, in, in the 2000s on YouTube, then they disappeared because they were not creating watch time in, enough. So people started to make longer and longer videos on YouTube. And that seemed to be a good idea and work well for YouTube until you realize that actually it's much harder to create a longer video. Uh, so on, on TikTok that only took short videos, uh, everybody could create a video. It was much easier. So the algorithm can learn much faster. And in the end, it can create more watch time because it learns very fast because you give it more signal. So each time you watch a video, each time you show the algorithm that you like this video, it gives a signal to the video, to the algorithm that you like this video. So you have around 20 to um, 100 times more signal on TikTok than on YouTube. So that's why uh, TikTok is winning on, on engagement because the AI is just much better at discovering what you like because it can learn much faster. Uh, and there is also a reason why it's, uh, it's very good because of its targeting to a younger audience that can spend more time uh, and because it can have more creators. So what are the problems of optimizing 
for engagement. So François Chollet, who's an engineer at Google, said that optimizing for a narrow opportunistic definition of engagement is basically the same as seeking to waste the most human potential with maximum efficiency. So this, this is crazy when you think of it. We're trying to waste as much human time as we can. Like the algorithms, both on TikTok and YouTube, are designed for that. They're not designed to bring you the maximum amount of information in the minimum amount of time. Because if you do that, so it's going to be very hard to be a journalist uh, on these platforms because if you try to bring the maximum amount of information on minimum amount of time, that's not good for ad revenue. Another problem with um, algorithms described by Zuckerberg this time, so I'm only using people from the platforms to describe their problems, um, it's borderline content. So Zuckerberg says that borderline content is actually more, uh, more efficient, create more engagement than, uh, than normal content. So content that is close to the policy line, that close to content that should be uh, prohibited. Um, and another problem on the platforms is uh, described by DeepMind of Google again, which is feedback loops in recommendation system that can give rise to echo chambers on filter bubbles. So these filter bubbles can narrow uh, user content exposure and ultimately change their worldview. Um, on TikTok, uh, there are a lot of uh, dark filter bubbles also that exist, so uh, depressive content. In the, last, uh, in the last 10 years, we've seen like the number of suicides that has skyrocketed uh, three times for uh, girls in, in the US. So this is a, a serious issue. Um, so are these engagement-based AIs really helping democracy? Because you could say, okay, now everybody can contribute, so it's, it's going to be great for democracy because now everybody can talk. Like we, we saw in Southeast Asia, we can go over some uh, censorship thanks to TikTok. Well, the problem is that in order to perform well on, on this platform, whether it's YouTube or TikTok, you have to understand the algorithm. On TikTok, there was a report this week that there was one billion views for the Russian paramilitary group uh, Wagner. So that's one billion views, it's, it's quite impressive. And uh, on YouTube we saw the same, like Russia today claimed to have been like the most successful news network on YouTube. And I think the reason is uh, that it's much easier for uh, dictatorships to perform well uh, on these platforms because they understand the algorithm better. They have dedicated teams uh, to try to understand and reverse engineer the algorithm. So if you do that, uh, you can perform better uh, than your competition. So here where everybody is kind of fighting against each other, like every influencer on YouTube, on uh, Twitter, if you have like a centralized government that pushes content um, that pleases him, it, it's much easier to do that uh, on these platforms. So TikTok has also been described as a magic uh, remote control for the CCP by uh, Science for All on, on YouTube and a Trojan horse because it's seemingly a free gift uh, to society that is fun and enjoyable, but then all the data that is uh, collected about you is sent back uh, to China. So for instance, uh, this, week, uh, this week too there was a report uh, in The Guardian that uh, TikTok uh, told uh, that uh, actually staff in China get access to their data. So this data can be used for anything from uh, advertisement to, um, uh, to anything they, they want. So we have a, a few issues with this um, TikTok algorithm. So I hate to be the, the guy that <laughs> says, okay, we have uh, problems because everybody is so enthusiastic about uh, TikTok today. Um, thanks, Brandy, to be a bit on my side. Um, but the issues are like this addictive design that wastes uh, people's time with a maximum efficiency. Um, I saw that when I was doing this interview for uh, the Wall Street Journal. And, um, 
the guy who was uh, the cameraman was telling me that he actually is, uh, his son was doing class prepa and he was doing a bit of TikTok to try to relax after a hard day of work. But then it was so addictive that he spent like nights like just watching TikToks and he was not performing well at work anymore because the algorithm was just uh, so addictive. And the algorithm is not designed to help you take a break and relax. It's designed to really keep you watching. So for someone uh, trying to work uh, in a competitive environment like a class prepa, it's, it's really not the best option. Um, so this centralized algorithm design can be easier to understand for uh, dictatorship than democracy. So we need to think, uh, we need to understand better the algorithm because at least if everybody would understand the algorithm well, at least we wouldn't have um, a drawback compared to uh, dictatorships. Uh, and the last issue for me is this tremendous amount of data collected. So I told you 20 to 100 times more information per minute on TikTok than on YouTube. And all this data can be used uh, to, to predict things about you. So when I was at Google, I worked on a project that was using your search queries to predict things about you. And same, uh, same here on TikTok, you can see everything that you watch and you, you enjoyed to predict a lot of things about you. But you have many, many more TikTok views uh, per day than searches on Google per day. So you can pre predict much more things. You can predict like a kid who's 13, you can predict his sexual orientation extremely fast. You can predict a, a lot of very creepy things uh, very fast. His favorite taste for music, his favorite body styles. Uh, when you think about that, it starts to be uh, very, pretty creepy. And the difference from like TikTok to, uh, to Twitter, for instance, is that on Twitter, everything you say is public, so it's things that you want uh, people to know. On TikTok, just passively listening to what you see, you, can, uh, you don't realize that you give information to uh, TikTok about who you are. And you give much more information than on YouTube. Um, so what do we need to do uh, about all that? I think uh, we need to be aware that TikTok uh, AI control billions of hours of watch time. And we, ne we know nearly nothing about it. We don't know if it's going to uh, favor the Wagner group or favor uh, reporters like Garants who are doing things to talk about this problem. Uh, and if the algorithm favors one thing over another, you can make as many TikTok videos as you want there's one, um, one side that's going to win. So we need to know if we want to live in a world where this uh, military, paramilitary group uh, will thrive, uh, and that will depend in part uh, on the algorithms we use. So we need much more investigations uh, to help uh, users know if TikTok is safe for them and, and their kids. And so that's why the work of researchers, journalists, regulators, for instance, with uh, European DSA and civil society uh, is so important. And so, yeah, be careful what this algorithm is doing. Thank you. Thank you. Please raise your hand if you have any question for Guillaume Chalot. Oui. Rudy. Um, so a question, because we've seen also with more regulated platforms or platforms that provide more data, such as Facebook, that we still don't know a lot about what's going on. What uh, tool exists to make sure that this data that we need to analyze these, uh, these algorithms, these companies, what, how can we make this available? Is it, is it simply a question of regulation? Is that the only tool? Or are there other ways to, to get that information as journalists? No, no we need... Yeah, we need uh, investigations. Um, so for instance, of tools that uh, Facebook has been giving, it's been giving like the 20 most viewed content on its platform per quarter. And that's kind of ridiculously small because 
uh, we need to know much more. We, we should be able to know at least like the 1,000 most viewed content on the platform like every day. So to be able to, to see what's going on on the platform. And as a journalist right now, it's super hard to see what's going on on Twitter because you, everybody is, is in his own filter bubble. So we need, I, I think we need regulation to tell to platforms, no, you need to give journalists journalists much more data about what's happening on your platform and how the algorithm works, what it's trying to optimize for exactly. And uh, like these uh, private documents uh, of TikTok, they should be public so that um, journalists can understand the platform better. Any other question? Please raise your hand. No. Everything is clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guillaume. <laughs> now, Jess, if you can come on stage. Thank you very much. You can't cancel me. It's the title of your presentation. Jess McHugh, she's a freelance journalist, and uh, she will talk about how to delete your account. <laughs> no, it's a joke. I try to, to be serious, but also playful, as Nick told me to do, if I am on, on TikTok. Not sure I'm going to be a good fit with TikTok. <laughs> Sorry for my voice, I'm getting over a cold, just like everybody, I think. Um, my name is Jess McHugh. I'm a reporter based here in Paris. Uh, I'm a journalist and author. I write about kind of various and sundry things. I would say kind of strange and unusual cultural and historical phenomena. Uh, I write a lot for a lot of different places, but the um, Washington Post, Time Magazine, New York Times, um, this most kind of most recently. And today I'm going to give you kind of more of a micro example of how TikTok shapes communities online, but also how kind of reporting, my reporting was shaped by TikTok. And it's really this, this uh, investigation that I did for The Guardian about a very strange uh, TikTok star. Uh, and the name of the article uh, is You Can't Cancel Me, uh, which is sort of a right wing dog whistle, um, but also an actual quote from my reporting. So we'll get to that. But maybe just to kind of give a little introduction, you know, this this story for The Guardian kind of got me thinking more broadly about the ways in which TikTok gives people a sense of belonging, it creates this sort of in-group, out-group online, but it also, I think we have this sense that because the internet makes so much information available, it's less easy for us to get tricked or duped or conned, but often that it's quite the opposite. Uh, you know, we're being exposed to so much information online, especially on a platform like TikTok in which you move through it so quickly that it becomes more and more difficult to kind of decipher what's true. So to just kind of give you an introduction to this person, this uh, phenomenon that is this woman named Brittany Dawn, um, she was started off as a fitness, uh, fitness influencer. She's from Texas. Uh, and uh, kind of unsurprisingly from the hair, you can probably tell that. Uh, and she, it turns out that she was committing what's essentially considered fraud because she was claiming to sell people, you know, tailored diet and fitness plans, and she was also marketing herself as a kind of eating disorder uh, advocate because she had struggled with an eating disorder. But it turns out what she was actually doing is she was giving everybody the same plan, uh, including women who she was kind of marketing specifically toward women with anorexia and bulimia, and she was giving them a plan that told them to eat 1,200 calories a day and work out for two hours a day. Um, so she, now, because of the ways in which she kind of got that money, including she took a COVID relief loan despite not believing in COVID, she's being sued by the Texas Attorney General for uh, damages of up to a million dollars. Um, so in the meantime, this comes out in 2019, but the charges weren't brought until this year. She's completely pivoted, rebranded, as you might say on TikTok, and she's become a influencer for Jesus. She is an evangelical TikTok star, and she actually makes a lot more money um, influencing for Jesus than she ever did uh, as a fitness influencer. 
Um, yes, so what, one of the things that I find kind of really fascinating about TikTok is the ways in which um, you know, extremism of any kind tends to have a pretty low ceiling, which is to say you can get a lot of people with extremist thoughts, kind of, or not a lot, you can get people drawn in with some radical thoughts. People are like, oh, that's an interesting idea. That's something I've never heard or it's something I've secretly believed but was afraid to say out loud. But it tends to have, oh, thank you. It tends to have quite a low ceiling, which is to say there's a limit to how many far right wing people that you're going to find in a given city or state. But there's no ceiling on TikTok. And this is something that she's capitalized on in a pretty kind of uh, astonishing way. Um, all right. So yeah, here is a picture of our, our friend Brittany Dawn uh, right after this, this news broke um, in 2019. And this was the last interview she's given to the press, um, uh, which was, yeah, again, three years ago. But TikTok has also been interesting because like any sort of content platform, it creates just an absolute abundance of information for reporters. You know, she didn't talk to me, but uh, between, you know, all of the TikToks that she did and I... One of her kind of major ticket things as a as an evangelical influencer beyond selling, you know, laminated Bible tabs and Bible highlighters and a lot of other kind of uh, Bible related merch is she runs these uh, evangelical weekend long conferences. So I went to one of those conferences in Dallas Fort Worth, um, which we'll get to a little bit later, but. I think what's what can be helpful for reporters is that there's just an absolute wealth of what people are saying. Even if they don't want to talk to you, she's already made hours and hours and hours of, of content that I could mine while I was doing this reporting. Okay, so here's an example of the kind of thing that she posts. Uh, common things that let demons in. And again, we're talking about right-wing evangelical Christians in Texas. So bear that in mind. But I was kind of surprised because like a lot of influencers, she starts off soft. You know, you have the sort of beige, well-appointed household. She's talking about, you know, Jesus loves you. You need to believe in yourself because Jesus believes in you. But it quickly veers into kind of the extreme end of things. So she makes a lot of videos like this. And some of the common things that let demons in, according to Brittany Dawn, are, you know, yoga, uh, horoscopes, crystals, uh, Lady Gaga. Um, so as you can see, this is like, this is not quite the sort of thing that would work in person because you can't really open with this as an opening gambit, it's so extreme. But it works well on TikTok because by the time you get to common things that let demons in, you've already watched hours and hours and hours of Britney Dawn content. Um, and that's sort of what I find fascinating about this is that when I went to this retreat, I kind of went semi undercover um, and participated in this weekend of evangelical worship. A lot of the women that I spoke to um, knew that she had this past of you know, being sued for what is essentially a being a con artist. But they said it doesn't matter to them because they can relate to her, they too feel like they're imperfect, uh, and that she's an example of what Jesus can redeem. Uh, but what I find sort of fascinating about this is they, they spend so much time living in her world that they're more interested in the Brittany Dawn version of Christianity than they are interested in, say, their local church um, and what tends to happen is that these women are drawn to her because they feel, or they feel, I should say feel is really the emphasis here, they feel excluded from kind of mainstream culture. There's this, there's this idea that I kind of came across amongst a lot of these women that, you know, the world is so politically correct now and so left wing and they can't say anything anymore and there's no such thing as a Christian city in America. And, you know, these are it's kind of an ironic belief because most of these women are white and blonde and in a lot of ways considered, you know, mainstream and yet they're the ones who feel persecuted. And this kind of community on TikTok has allowed them to find a sense of belonging and a sense of in group and it's what makes it so powerful because it's all women it's all women with these same beliefs who look like them and they don't care that they have to pay you know 625 dollars to experience this once a month at the retreat 
Uh, and a lot of it, I think, goes back to loneliness. You know, we TikTok is capitalizing on people who feel, um, you know, put aside in some way, whether that's a real or an imagined isolation. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, Guillaume, what you were saying earlier about the addictive design of TikTok. And that's something that is so true here in that, you know, with kind of traditional understandings of church or worship, there is a beginning and there is an end. Uh, but on TikTok, there's no, there's no beginning and end. There's no mass is over, now I'm gonna go do a different activity. The time of worship, quote unquote, can be all the time. And it leads to these sort of kind of religious adjacent, I would say almost cult-like figures, much like Brittany Dawn. Um, and here's a, a last example here. This was from the, um, this was from the retreat that I attended in, in Fort Worth. This is Brittany Dawn on the right there, baptizing somebody in a horse trough. Um, and again, I think it, it speaks to the fact that much like other forms of extremism, much like a cult, uh, you don't open with your most extreme kind of vision. You don't start with, we're going to baptize you in a horse trough. Um, it kind of builds little by little. And, and part of that is this sort of addictive design online. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be criticized in TikTok. And what is a little bit frightening about figures like this is how quickly they can build a following. You know, I think she joined in 2020. She already has 1.2 million followers, which is way more than she has on uh, YouTube or Instagram, which she's been doing for years. And a lot of what made her kind of pop was that she has these views about, of course, unsurprisingly, uh, she's very into QAnon, um, anti-COVID. And so it's sort of this strange um, hydra of different conspiracy beliefs that really flourish alongside kind of maybe some more traditional but still extreme views of Christianity. Um, Maybe one kind of thing to close, I think it's important, I mean, as evidenced by this conference today, it's important to take TikTok seriously, which is something that took me a little while to come to because I'm, you know, print journalist and a little bit old school in a lot of ways. But um, I, wrote, I wrote this book called American and that's about how best-selling books shape culture. But it's really given me an appreciation for the ways in which things that we dismiss as innocuous or unimportant or mundane are actually the things that are, can be very revelatory of how people are thinking or feeling or what they're worrying about or what they hope to achieve. And I think TikTok can kind of serve as, as a litmus test in that similar way of, you know, the things that people consume online can be very profound in in, in revealing their anxieties, whether it's the sense of, you know, being set apart in a culture that they don't believe in, or whether it's isolation, or, you know, any number of things. And so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be participating in, in, this, in this conference today, and thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Now your turn, Shin. Thank you again. Now, Shin Labé, she's a former student from uh, Sciences Po Journalism School. She's the editor-in-chief of NewsGuard. And uh, she said uh, TikTok had a scroll and a search problems. Two issues, in fact. Um, hi, everyone. I'm French, but I was told that I would reach a wider audience if I spoke English, so I'm going to speak in English. Um, uh, my, my company is actually US-based, so um, it's fine uh, both ways. I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually a, um, a graduate from the dual degree between the Sciences Po Journalism School and the Columbia Journalism School, so I see some friendly faces out there, too. Um, I'm here to talk about news and information on TikTok um, from a very specific point of view, uh, which is the point of view of my company which focuses on misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda. Um, so just a, a few words really very quickly on my company before I turn on to the subject that we're here to talk about today, so TikTok. Um, I work for a company called NewsGuard, so 
you may have heard about us, actually it was mentioned in, a, in an earlier um, um, presentation. Um, we're a company that was founded in March 2018 by journalists with journalists, um, even though some journalists still like to present us as former journalists, <laughs> which we still are journalists. Um, and the mission really was for us to fight online misinformation. Um, so obviously it's March 2018, it's right after the 2016 presidential election in the US with the context uh, with that regard that we know. And the idea was what else can we bring to the table in terms of fighting misinformation on top of fact checking. Um, and so the idea was instead of focusing on individual claims, we're going to rate sources at the source level. So a full source instead of an individual claim. And um, the idea for, for that is that of course fact checking is important, will remain important. We actually use a lot of fact checking in our own work do our own fact checking as well, but you just can't fact check everything because there is so much false claims out there. Uh, it's just impossible and also by the time often that you fact checked a claim, uh, it's been moved aside by a new false claim or a variation of that false claim. Um, and so at first we were just a browser extension, um, so really the idea was to help users navigate online, distinguish between reliable and non-reliable sources of information, um, but now we actually have two databases, so one of all the sources that, um, that news and information sources that you can find online and their reliability, their credibility, their transparency. Um, but also a new, another database because having a close look at monitoring all the misinformation websites out there, uh, we, we, were, we realized that we were having a really close look at all the, all the um, false claims that were circulating online. So we now have another database um, looking at all the, basically a catalog of all the false claims that you can find online. Um, and now they're used by, a, a, a big diversity of, of partners, so from researchers um, to um, social media platforms, um, brands, uh, government units, etc. Um, and just very quickly, those, this, is, this is just our progress to date. So we're in seven countries. We've rated over 8,000 sites um, in about uh, almost 400 myth uh, to this day. Um, so what should we care about TikTok and why do we care about TikTok when we look at misinformation, disinformation, propaganda? So as I was saying, a big chunk of our work is looking at the main myth that are circulating online. Um, and so, of course, that has brought us to all social media platforms, including TikTok. Um, but the reason really I think we should all care about TikTok and why we care about TikTok is uh, first because of its huge audience. So as you know, in late 2021, it, um, it celebrated attracting more than 1 billion monthly active users. It's the first non-Facebook app that has reached that milestone. It's also the, the fastest growing app, um, a social media app today. Um, and as, as was said in many different uh, presentations before, it has a very young uh, user base. Um, so these are just two numbers for the US. A quarter of the app's users are, um, are thought to be between the age of 10 and 8, 19, um, despite the, the app being forbidden to people under 13. We know it's very easy actually to use it, um, and a lot of users are much younger. And in, the, in, in France, it's approximately 30% that are under 18. So of course it's important, it's people we want to be talking to and it's a very fast growing um, uh, growing up. Um, so again, this was said in many presentations before, um, some people tend to think that as TikTok as just light, entertaining uh, videos, funny memes, um, uh, songs, etc. But it's not just that, as we know, um, definitely not. Looking at, for, from our perspective, at the myth in our database on um, a lot of um, news um, uh, subjects, we realized that a lot of the myth that we have in our database actually live a life of their own on TikTok, not related to outlets that we know, but just a, a, live, a, life, of, a life of their own from influencers um, and other users um, of the app. And that actually a lot of the content there is political and or newsy. And one proof of that is that in 2021, late last year, TikTok actually surpassed Google as the f most popular website worldwide. Um, and that's actually because it's also used as a search engine. So of course it's not just used as a search engine for news. It's um, a lot of people will use it to search for what restaurants to eat at tonight or what cream to use uh, in order to age uh, less quickly. But a lot of people will use it to search for news. Um, and of course it's only the beginning. This is, um, um, I mean, you, you all know that TikTok 
has huge ambitions uh, that go far beyond its current use from um, surpassing Google, but surpassing also Netflix, surpassing Amazon. So the, the idea that I want um, um, to really move forward is that uh, whether people come for entertainment videos, for the shop in the future, for information, for news, people will stay longer in the app uh, because there will be more experiences. And so um, they will find whether they came looking for it or not, they will find more information there. And because of its success, you also have to take it uh, reversely. It means that a lot of platforms are looking at what TikTok is doing that makes it so popular and successful, and they're trying to copy that. Uh, and so it might, uh, looking at what's happening there is also a roadmap for us to understand what might happen on other platforms as well. Um, so I see, um, I see from my, again, my perspective, which is a narrow one, of course, uh, looking at misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, I see two main problems with TikTok at the moment, um, the search and the scroll problem. So let's um, first talk about the scroll problem. Imagine that you are scrolling on TikTok. I know I've seen before that a lot of you have TikTok accounts. And I want you, I want to take a little survey, maybe have a few uh, hands raised to give me a, a response. How long do you think it'll take you when you're just scrolling, very regular use of the For You page on TikTok, uh, how long do you think it'll take you to come um, uh, to see, have presented on your feed misinformation on the war in Ukraine or COVID-19? Anyone with a guess? Come on. Yeah. 40 swipes. 40 swipes. So how, how many minutes do you think? Two minutes. Two minutes. OK. So I have a very, very pessimistic crowd. This, ha this has happened to me last week as well. I was in Helsinki, and I asked that question um, to a crowd of journalists, and they said seconds. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> no not that bad. But still, we did the t test um, back in September 2021 and March 2022 for COVID-19 and Russia-Ukraine misinformation. And uh, the answer is it took our analysts or the people that we had recruited for the test uh, less than 40 minutes to come up with, to, to see, basically, be confronted with misinformation. It might seem long, you're thinking two minutes. Journalists I talked to in Finland were thinking seconds, but it's actually not that long if you think about how much, how long on average people use TikTok. So by the end of 2021, kids and teens were watching an average of 91 minutes of TikTok per day, um, which means that it's very likely that most of them were confronted with misinformation on that day, on every day, basically. Um, so we did the test with COVID-19 misinformation, and we, we recruited children, uh, very young children, under supervision from their parents or adults that they knew from 9 to 17. Um, and basically, we, we were instructing them to have very little engagement with the platform, just look at, um, at videos that were about the pandemic, um, whatever they were. And what we found is that within 30 five minutes, they were all but one shown misinformation about COVID-19. Some videos were labeled, were labeled as containing misinformation because COVID-19 was front of mind. Um, and so there was a lot of policies around that at the moment, but not all of them were. Uh, so that's the example of my nephew, a 13-year-old uh, French speaker. He was shown a satirical video related to COVID-19 just 17 seconds after signing up. Um, and after 20 minutes, it was a video uh, warning of a new world order, so very conspiratorial, um, um, saying that a French rapper called Kenny Arcana, uh, it's actually a very old song, but that, that rapper had understood everything. Did we just lose my presentation? Okay, that, that basically that rapper had understood everything. Um, when saying that um, that governments were preparing the grounds for the biggest genocide uh, with poisoned vaccines. Um, and that was just literally looking at videos that mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic, not liking anything, and with a brand new account that had no um, likes, uh, followed no one, etc. And after half an hour on TikTok, he was almost exclusively shown misinformation from very well-known uh, misinformation providers in France. Um, so we did the same uh, basically when just after the war started in, in Russia, in, in Ukraine, after the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we did the same. We took uh, this time analysts from our company 
uh, and we, we each downloaded the app for uh, brand new, didn't follow anything, and we just watched the For You feed for 45 minutes, just scrolled. Um, and what we found is that uh, within 40 minutes, uh, again, uh, we were all shown false or misleading content, and this time there was no la labeling in uh, none of the videos that we were sh shown. So that was me. Uh, within 29 minutes, I was shown a video of a speech by Vladimir Putin uh, claiming that neo-Nazis have taken power in Ukraine um, without context, but just subtitled in French. Uh, then within 36 minutes, um, I was shown a video of a, ma of a man, just a, a TikToker, claiming that all the images of the war were fake. Um, and again, no context, nothing. Um, so the problem here is I'm not trying to say that the For You feed of TikTok will always show you misinformation. Uh, of course, it, it won't just feed you misinformation. But the problem is that there, it will feed you misinformation among a lot of very reliable pieces of information, funny memes, uh, very cool videos. And there is no uh, distinction between all these videos. And that's the problem. The app's design, you're scrolling and you're seeing without context a, a, a speech by Putin and then a very very reliable uh, video from France 2 explaining you uh, the context about the war. Um, and that's just the scroll problem, which is, of course, um, the use that we know most when we think about TikTok. But as I was saying earlier, um, now TikTok is more and more used as a search engine as well. So there is also a search problem. Um, we know that uh, actually uh, uh, about a quarter of U.S. adults uh, under 30 are now regularly getting news on TikTok. That's um, a Pew Research survey from uh, released in October, so that's very new data. And what's interesting is that this is growing, whereas on other platforms it's actually declining. Less and less people are getting news on other social media platforms, but it's growing on TikTok. Um, and so the questions we wanted to uh, to respond to was, okay, so people are searching more and more news on TikTok. Um, they're finding news on TikTok. What are they finding when they're searching for, in for information on the most important topics uh, of, of news of the moment? So we did the, um, we did the test and we found that about almost 20% of the videos presented in the top 20 results uh, in the TikTok search, search bar when you're searching for news on all the major news events um, contain misinformation. That includes Russia, Ukraine, school shootings in the US, um, the, the COVID-19 vaccines, the pandemic, the midterms, etc. That's a report that we released um, just last September. Um, so these are just a few examples. I mean, here you have a video saying that the Bucha massacre in French was staged by the um, Ukrainian Secret Service and the British Secret Service. Um, then next to it, you have a video claiming that, um, well, the, 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 a, a lot of um, massacres are staged in Ukraine because look, there's a, here you see a body resurrecting from the dead. This was actually um, a demonstration against uh, climate change in Austria in February 2022. So nothing to do with Ukraine. Um, and then you have just a video showing how to make hydroxychloroquine at home um, to treat your COVID, which we know is not a proven treatment for COVID and can be very dangerous to make at home. Um, and what was it interesting is that um, Google, by comparison, provided much less misinformation in its search result. We compared the two search engines and also less polarizing resu results when it came especially to the um, midterm elections in, U in the US. Um, and the problem is that not only does TikTok promote videos that contain misinformation in its top 20 results, as we saw, almost 20%, it also suggests very charged uh, phrases when you type in a neutral search. So this is an example here comparing um, uh, a search on Google and on, um, and on TikTok. So if you, so the, the, the Google one is the black one. And as you can see, very neutral suggestion. You type in COVID vaccine, um, the, the search suggests walk in COVID vaccine, types of COVID vaccines, etc. But on TikTok, it'll suggest COVID vaccine injury, COVID vaccine truth, COVID vaccine exposed. So it'll push you towards more misinformation. Um, we saw the same with climate change. The, 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 the TikTok search bar was, would suggest climate change debunked, climate change doesn't exist. Um, same for Bucha. The first search term that was suggested for Bucha on TikTok was Bucha fake. Um, 
So uh, this is very problematic, also, uh, of course, and we observed a similar phenomenon last week when we published a, a report that actually Guillaume um, talked about in his pre presentation earlier about the, the um, private Russian mil parallel military group, Wagner Group. Um, so we looked at, at, uh, at videos on, on TikTok that were promoting uh, the group or glorifying the group's action, and we found that um, autocomplete suggestions encouraged users to search for more violent videos about the group. Um, so when you typed uh, Wagner, um, the, the search bar would suggest Wagner execution, Wagner sledgehammer, same in Russian. Um, so here you have the, the search terms in, in, um, in Russian and in English that were suggested by the, by the TikTok search bar. And what we found um, in this report, we showed that 100, we found 160 clips on TikTok that were depicting or alluding to violence by the group, um, and they had been viewed uh, more than one billion times. Interestingly, we, uh, of course, we called TikTok for comment, and um, we they, they deleted a few of the hashtags and a few of the videos before we published, and then now they're almost all gone after we've published the report. Um, but it was very easy to find before we published the report, which is very worrying. Um, and also, what you have to keep in mind is that sometimes if you type in a very popular um, um, uh, event of the news, you won't find any misinformation, but that doesn't mean that there isn't any. That means that maybe the users have uh, learned how the algorithm works and have found ways to avoid uh, the algorithm, algorithmic moderation. So um, you have to be aware of what we call TikTok's algo speak. So basically all those code words, uh, those phrases that are used to avoid algorithmic detection. So for example, today, if you type um, election fraud on TikTok, chances are you won't find much. But if you tap, type election fraud with, with a, o, a zero instead of an O, there will be a lot of content. If you type natural abortion with O's instead of, uh, with zeros instead of O's, same thing. Um, and so that means that the content is still there. Users actually know how to find it. But for us who uh, maybe don't, don't, don't look for that type of content, um, uh, we, we just, we have to learn the codes to find it, but it's there, which is also very, um, very worrying. Um, so the challenge, and I mean, a lot has been said by Guillaume before me, so I won't spend too much time on it, but um, it's important, I think, and, and Guillaume has, uh, has uh, highlighted it before, that to understand that the videos that appear both in the scroll feeds and in the search um, are both determined by the algorithms of TikTok. Um, what do we know about these algorithms? Well, Guillaume has uh, given you a lot of clues, and we also know a little bit, uh, uh, we actually know a little bit because <laughs> they've shared the broad outlines of the recommendation system. And there was also a leak um, in the New York Times, um, an internal document document called TikTok Algo One on One, which is actually very interesting because it, would, it was written by the engineering team in Beijing, but it was meant for non-technical people. So it was very clearly explaining um, what the algorithm was intending to do. And so what we know is that each video gets a score uh, based on likes, comments, playtime, as well as an indication uh, that the video has been played or if it was just you know, scrolled over. And so the recommender system basically returns a video depending on its score. So the higher the score, the more it'll be recommended to other users. And broadly speaking, what we know is that it recommends two metrics retention, whether a user will come back, and time spent. Um, and what we also know, as I think I've showed in my earlier slides, is that TikTok's algorithm failed the misinformation test. And we don't know much uh, what, about what the company does in that respect. Um, what we've asked, uh, of course, when we publish reports, we ask TikTok specific questions. So we've asked them a very simple, very specific question about the algorithm. Uh, we asked them, does your uh, algorithm, uh, uh, is it tailored to prevent it from feeding users misinformation? And if so, how? And of course, TikTok just gave us a general, generic answer as to what they were doing to fighting misinformation, but did not respond specifically to that regard. Um, that's also a graph that uh, Guillaume had in his presentation, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but the problem is that we know that uh, content that contains misinformation tends to get more engagement, um, and that's not according to me, that's according to Max Zuckerberg. Um, 
So, uh, so of course, that is all very problematic. And um, what we know, again, uh, because I was saying, well, TikTok um, fails the misinformation test. We don't know much what they're doing specifically to that regard. What we know is what, is what they tell us, uh, and they tell us some. They tell us that the videos are automatically reviewed by the AI, and that if the AI detects an issue, then a human moderator will come in for a further review. But what we also know is that in the first quarter of 2022, TikTok removed more than 102 million videos, that's a lot, but less than 1% were removed for violating rules on misinformation. That's nothing. Um, and we know that there's a lot of misinformation on the platform. And that's not very surprising, actually, because we know that the AI is not great at spotting misinformation, uh, disinformation, it's even worse at spotting uh, propaganda, because to understand propaganda, you have to understand intent, you have to understand who the provider of the information is, and that's where humans come in. That, that's where, um, that's why we at NewsGuard are doing it with journalists um, in a very human-based way, um, because unfortunately the AI is not great at fighting misinform misinformation. Um, so that's all from me. Uh, here's my email if you want to get in touch. Um, we also uh, are very happy to give vouchers uh, to use our browser extension to journalists covering misinformation and just journalists in general. Uh, so don't hesitate to, um, to yeah, be in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shin. Um, if you want to grab a seat, euh, on a cinq minutes peut-être euh, pour que vous asseyez correctement plutôt que sur les marches. Vous seriez mieux. Et puis si on a un problème d'évacuation, il faut qu'on puisse accéder au couloir. Merci beaucoup. En attendant, Marion Vis et Jean-François Fogel vont prendre place sur l'estrade. Nous sommes parfaitement dans les temps. Il va être 12h25, c'était ce qu'on avait annoncé. Marion Viss, elle est euh, rédactrice en chef euh, d'un nouveau site qui s'appelle The Audiencer, qui euh, parle beaucoup de, des performances euh, à obtenir sur les différentes audiences. Vous pouvez apprendre beaucoup. Euh, et Jean-François Fogel, c'est le directeur de l'Executive Master en Management des Médias et du Numérique, qui travaille euh, à Sciences Po à l'Executive Education. Et c'est la deuxième étude qui va être révélée aujourd'hui, euh, qui est sur euh, le tech stack des éditeurs en 2022. Ben, bonjour, bonjour à tous. Euh... On a 10 minutes pour vous présenter une étude qui fait une cinquantaine de pages. Mais euh, euh, on va expliquer le principe assez vite et puis quelques points. Euh, quand euh, Elon Musk a pris le contrôle seul de, de Twitter, au bout de trois semaines, enfin trois semaines et un jour exactement, il a envoyé un mail à ses ingénieurs en disant « Est-ce que quelqu'un peut m'expliquer la tech stack de Twitter ?» Euh, la tech stack, c'est stack, c'est l'empilement, c'est l'empilement de technologie euh, qui fait qu'une plateforme marche sur le numérique. Euh, une plateforme d'information, d'un site de presse, c'est une accumulation d'outils, des outils quand vous arrivez pour gérer, euh, pour gérer les, les, les cookies, mais des outils pour euh, que vous puissiez écouter des podcasts, pour envoyer des newsletters, pour publier des contenus, pour suivre le trafic, euh, euh, des outils qui permettent euh, euh, de faire des cartes, de faire des, 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 des infographies. C'est ça qu'on a, euh, qu a voulu étudier. C'est un peu compliqué à étudier, en fait, parce que, évidemment, chacun a sa tecta, sa Textac et à son secret. Et en principe, euh, on vous en parle au café si c'est des copains, mais on ne vous dit pas euh, quelle est la Textac de tel ou tel euh, site d'information. Donc c'est ça qu'on voulait savoir. On voulait le savoir pour des raisons évidentes, parce que la technologie utilisée par une, un site d'information a un impact énorme sur les conditions de sa production et sur la façon dont l'information est diffusée. Donc euh, c'est quand même difficile de, de, 
d'imaginer euh, euh, qu'on peut parler de façon neutre, hors technologie, de la tech stack. Alors, Marion va vous expliquer comment on a pu euh, le faire, puisque c'est elle qui a inventé la méthode qu'il avait faite une première fois, et il y a deux écoles de Sciences Po qui l'ont donc reprise. Voilà. Bonjour à tous. Est-ce que vous m'entendez Oui. Euh, alors, comment on a fait pour connaître ce que personne ne dit euh, On a simplement posé la question, on a créé un, un questionnaire ouvert euh, en ligne, en l'occurrence un, un type form, puisqu'on parle tech aujourd'hui, euh, et on a demandé à nos contacts et globalement à tous les sites de presse d'information en ligne en France de répondre à un grand questionnaire, donc euh, complètement ouvert et non contraignant. Donc on a cherché à savoir les outils qui sont utilisés dans trois catégories euh, principales. Les outils utilisés par l'équipe marketing, donc pour les analytics, euh, l'abonnement, la monétisation. Euh, les outils de l'équipe éditoriale, donc pour les journalistes, comment ils diffusent du contenu sur euh, le CMS du site par exemple, euh, comment ils fabriquent des cartes, comment ils envoient des push, euh, notifications sur les téléphones. Et enfin les options techniques qui ont été choisies par, par les éditeurs de presse. Donc il y a trois catégories. Tous les répondants ont pu répondre soit aux trois, soit à une, soit à deux, soit, soit à tout. Euh, donc, comme je vous dis, ce n'était pas contraignant. Nous avons eu 87 tech stacks qui ont été décrites. Donc, vous voyez derrière nous euh, les logos des, des sites de presse ou des groupes de presse qui ont accepté de nous répondre. Donc, on a eu une vingtaine euh, de groupes euh, et, euh, et le reste des sites individuels. Alors, certains répondants sont dans la salle aujourd'hui. Euh, évidemment, le principe, c'est la confidentialité. Donc, on ne vous dira pas qui a répondu quoi. Euh, mais en tout cas, on remercie... Euh, remercier les personnes qui sont là de nous, de, de nous avoir livré ces infos, comme disait Jean-François, très secrètes. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, 87 textes actes décrites, on le disait, donc il y a une vingtaine de groupes, donc on imagine que les informations qu'on a portent, on ne peut pas le savoir avec certitude, mais portent sur une centaine, peut-être bien davantage, de sites en France. Euh, pour vous donner une petite idée, si vous connaissez le classement ACPM, euh, c'est le classement des plus gros sites d'information en France, on a eu les réponses de 57 d'entre eux, donc 57%. Euh, donc on, on, on est assez confiant sur, sur, sur la qualité des données euh, et leur portée qu'on va partager, euh, qu partager aujourd'hui. Dernier point juste, qui a répondu au sein, de ces, au sein de ces groupes Alors on a eu beaucoup de CTO, donc euh, de chefs de la tech, on a eu quelques rédacteurs en chef aussi, et on a eu des directeurs ou responsables marketing, donc vraiment tous les profils, euh, tous les types de profils qui ont pu répondre à nos questions. Alors comment Je vous montre en très résumé, il y a 30 outils utilisés. Je vous montre un des 30 qui est quelque chose que tous ceux qui travaillent dans les rédactions connaissent, qui est la messagerie. En fait, quand, quand Stack est, est, Slack est, pardon, est apparu, euh, il y a, Slack aura 10 ans l'an prochain, c'est devenu un, un must dans les rédactions. D'un seul coup, une rédaction, c'est une messagerie. Donc on a, et, et, il y a même des séminaires uniquement sur comment paramétrer, comment utiliser la messagerie. Ce que vous voyez là, c'est vous voyez les solutions qui sont les plus utilisées. Donc Microsoft Teams est passé devant Slack. Beaucoup utilisent WhatsApp, Google Chat. Vous voyez, il y a quelques solutions maison. Ce qu'on voit, c'est que si vous faites la, 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 la somme des taux d'équipement, c'est-à-dire si vous prenez toutes les solutions et puis vous voyez le pourcentage, vous voyez qu'on est à plus de 100%. Donc c'est clair qu'il y, y a des rédactions qui tournent, avec, euh, qui tournent avec plusieurs messageries à la fois. On leur a demandé à chaque fois de mettre une note sur 10 sur la qualité globalement. Euh, et ceux qui travaillent dans les rédactions le savent, les messageries fonctionnent bien. La, la note moyenne, c'est 7,4 sur 10, donc euh, plutôt des bonnes notes. On leur a demandé euh, de faire des remarques ou des commentaires. Donc là, on en a mis certains. Il y a trop d'outils, il y a trop de channels, c'est du chaos. Un seul, ce serait plus simple. C'est addictif. Enfin bon, on est d'ailleurs dans une phase où les rédactions ont plutôt tendance à réduire l'usage des messageries pour le moment. Mais ça, c'est une bonne note. On a vu aussi des mauvaises notes. Oui, et euh, me revient euh, de vous présenter la pire note euh, de notre étude, qui est, euh, vous pouvez y aller, Jean-François, qui est la gestion des abonnements. 
Euh, alors, ça n'a pas été le thème de la journée, mais vous l'avez probablement vu depuis une quinzaine d'années, le pullul sur les sites d'information, ce qu'on appelle les paywalls. Donc, c'est le petit, le, le petit truc qui vous bloque quand vous essayez de lire, de lire l'article et qui vous dit d'aller vous abonner ou d'aller créer un compte pour pouvoir lire la suite du contenu. Euh, évidemment, ça s'est lié à la bascule du modèle économique des médias en ligne, euh, qui donc a démarré il y a une vingtaine d'années euh, maintenant, euh, de multiplier les, 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 les jambes en fait, de, de monétisation du contenu, c'est-à-dire d'ajouter les readers revenus, donc l'abonnement, euh, aux côtés de la publicité. Donc on peut se dire, comme ça fait quand même 20 ans que les médias ont commencé à essayer de se rémunérer par les lecteurs en direct, notamment via les abonnements, que cette catégorie d'outils pouvait être bien servie, et bien c'est tout l'inverse, donc c'est la plus mauvaise note, 5,6 sur 10. Euh, les outils, vous avez vu le nombre d'outils qui sont cités, il y en a énormément euh, et même ceux qui ont développé Maison euh, vous avez vu, c'est la, euh, la deuxième des, des solutions euh, qui est, équipe 16% de nos, de nos répondants euh, n'a eu que 5,8 sur 10 donc on voit qu'il y a un énorme pain point sur cette question de, du gestion, gestionnaire des abonnements l'une des raisons principales c'est que l'abonnement, euh, même s'il est à la mode depuis une quinzaine, vingtaine d'années euh, en ligne euh, existe en réalité depuis très très longtemps sur le print et que donc ce sont des outils print qu'on a essayé de tordre dans tous les sens pour qu'ils fonctionnent pour des outils pour les abonnements numériques et on voit bien qu'a priori ça a été mal tordu et donc euh, qu'est ce qu'on peut retenir donc ce qu'on voit sur les outils donc on a étudié, on a étudié 30 euh, catégories d'outils google a un outil présent dans 12 des 30 catégories euh, on ne s'attendait pas à voir Google euh, aussi, euh, aussi présent. Pour vous donner quelques, quelques exemples, on a évidemment Google Analytics pour étudier les audiences des sites. On a Google Data Studio pour faire des dashboards de performance. On a Google Optimize pour euh, faire des ABTS, Google Ad Manager pour diffuser la publicité sur les sites. Bref, Google est absolument partout. Euh, le fait de développer sa propre solution en interne et donc de ne pas prendre une solution dite sur étagère euh, est aussi assez ré répandu. On a la solution maison qui apparaît dans 24% des cas. Par contre, elle est euh, la plus choisie et ou la mieux notée dans seulement 5% des cas. Donc on voit bien que même quand on fait nous-mêmes, on n'en est pas forcément très content. Euh, les analytics, je ne vais pas passer trop de temps parce qu'on pourrait passer la journée dessus, mais ça reste un problème euh, à la fois technique, à la fois légal. Ce qui s'est passé, c'est que depuis le 25 mai... Défini analytics. Pardon, analytics, excuse-moi. Euh, analytics, bah, c'est la mesure d'audience. C'est simplement la mesure d'audience euh, d'un site Internet. Euh, donc vous avez, vous l'imaginez, des, des tags, en l'occurrence, c'est via des cookies euh, qui se déposent sur votre, sur votre navigateur et qui permettent à un éditeur de presse de savoir combien de personnes sont venues sur son site, d'où viennent ces personnes-là, quels articles elles ont lus, euh, etc. Donc, donc on a à la fois de la donnée comporte... enfin, c'est surtout de la donnée comportementale. Euh, les analytics, euh, vous savez que depuis le 25 mai 2018, vous allez sur un site et on vous demande si vous acceptez les cookies, euh, le dépôt de cookies sur votre terminal ou pas. Si vous n'acceptez pas, il n'y a pas de data, il n'y a pas de tracking. Euh, ça, c'est quand ça marche correctement. Euh, et donc, vous ne pouvez, pouvez pas être suivi. Donc, il y a un premier problème, c'est que les éditeurs de presse euh, ont, ont de moins en moins de données comportementales euh, à cause de cette euh, contrainte légale. Euh, une autre contrainte légale, c'est qu'en début d'année, au printemps, euh, la CNIL a, a dit que Google Analytics, euh, son utilisation n'était plus conforme, n'était plus légale. Donc, ça fait que, par exemple, Le Monde a enlevé euh, de son site internet, lemonde.fr, cet été, le tag, euh, le tag Google Analytics. Euh, donc je vous parle de Google Analytics particulièrement, euh, mais il y a le sujet des euh, cookies aussi. Euh, vous le savez, les cookies tiers vont être, euh, vont être bannis des navigateurs, euh, en tout cas de, de, de Google. Ça, ils n'arrêtent pas de reporter, mais probablement l'année prochaine. Bref, donc le fait de suivre le suivi d'audience sur les sites Internet, notamment les sites de presse, est un problème de plus en plus important auquel on l'a vu. Et je, le petit QR code là, vous permet de télécharger la, la synthèse. Euh, les éditeurs, pour l'instant, n'ont pas de solution euh, vraiment concrète pour, euh, pour faire face à, cette, euh, à ce problème. Et sinon, Jean-François et moi, on s'est bien trompé aussi en demandant euh, à, nos, à nos répondants quel outil euh, d'image satellite et quel outil de reconnaissance faciale ils utilisaient. On s'est bien rendu compte, Jean-François, vous faites plus de, de congrès de journalistes que moi, mais euh, ce sont des mots à la mode, mais en fait, euh, personne ou presque en France n'est équipé. Et donc, ce sont finalement des questions qu'on n'a pas, euh, qu pas traitées. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on a vu concernant la, la, les salles de rédaction Il y a un outil qui s'appelle CrowdTangle. Je ne sais pas si vous le connaissez. C'est un outil qui, qui a été créé par, par Facebook, maintenant euh, Meta, 
qui est un outil qui permet de mesurer euh, l'impact des informations, ou en tout cas d'un événement, sur votre page Facebook, mais aussi sur la page Facebook de vos concurrents. C'est pour ça que c'est devenu un outil pour certains qu fait, euh, qui travaillent ou qui ont fait des stages dans des rédactions. C'est devenu un outil qui guide énormément le travail rédactionnel. Ce qu'on voit, c'est que euh, dans les commentaires, on voit qu'il y a beaucoup d'angoisse, puisque euh, Zuckerberg a dit... On va le retirer, mais il n'a pas dit quand. Or, il y a quand même 20% des, des répondants qui utilisent cet outil et qui l'utilisent pour orienter le travail rédactionnel. Ce qu'on a vu aussi, c'est que tous les autres outils alternatifs qui pourraient être créés, finalement, aucun ne s'est imposé. Aucun ne s'est imposé de façon forte. Et si euh, euh, ce qu'ils feront, on peut penser, Meta retire Crow Tangle, il y a une sorte d'espace de, ou de vide qui apparaîtra. On va parler un peu, alors il y a 30 outils, donc on ne va pas tous les, tous les présenter, mais je vais quand même un peu parler du, de l'outil euh, le, le, pour, pour poster sur les réseaux sociaux. Donc c'est une journée TikTok. Vous voyez que TikTok n'apparaît pas. Pourquoi Parce que quand on fait... Euh, quand on fait un, 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 un site Internet, et, et, et si on, surtout si c'est un gros site, on a besoin d'automatiser, d'industrialiser et d'avoir beaucoup, euh, beaucoup de données. Donc l'outil le plus, le plus utilisé, c'est Ecobox actuellement. Euh, beaucoup d'entre vous le savent, qui permet à la fois d'être sur euh, Facebook, sur euh, certains, euh, certains secteurs de Reddit et sur Instagram. Donc on est capable de... C'est ce qui permet à des sites de poster la nuit, alors qu'il n'y a personne dans la rédaction qui permette de poster, alors que tout le monde a filé pour aller déjeuner. Donc euh, ces outils-là, donc Ecobox, OutSuite, qui est très important. On voit TweetDeck, parce que TweetDeck permet de, 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 de la même façon de, de publier. Les outils sont là. Pourquoi TikTok n'est pas encore là J'ai ai beaucoup aimé euh, l'intervention de Keo Kao ce matin parce qu'il disait, et je le crois, TikTok ne peut pas rester en l'état. Ce dont on a parlé, il euh, y a des problèmes. Comment ça va être monétisé pour les éditeurs Il y a des problèmes sur comment ça va s'arranger avec, euh, avec, euh, avec les autres réseaux sociaux où on publie. Pour le moment... Il y a, je pense, je dis peut-être une bêtise, je crois qu'Agora Pulse permet de programmer simplement quand est-ce qu'on va publier sur TikTok, mais pas d'aller de, de, plus loin. Donc ce, tout ce qu'on a entendu ce matin sont des gens qui le font à part, qui le, sont des équipes dédiées, ce sont des journalistes qui sont directement sur TikTok. L'avenir de TikTok, c'est de se faire manger s'il veut avoir de l'influence comme se sont fait manger les autres avant, c'est-à-dire de rentrer dans le système, je ne sais pas si ça se rappellera Ecobox ou tout de suite, mais en tout cas, il y aura, il y aura nécessairement une sorte d'industrialisation qui, qui va absorber cela. Euh, juste, il y a un point aussi, parce qu'on a essayé de savoir quel était le poids de la technique dans les sites d'information. Oui, on a voulu savoir ça. Euh, alors moi, par exemple, il y a probablement beaucoup de journalistes dans la salle. Moi, je n'en suis pas une. Je suis une marketeuse. Et, euh, et, et pour avoir beaucoup bossé avec des journalistes et aussi, euh, et aussi des techs, on, on se rend compte que les, les, les forces et les poids de chacun sont assez euh, euh, inégaux. Et donc, on le voit très bien avec, euh, avec ce camembert. Donc, on a demandé en fait, à chaque répondant de nous dire le nombre d'ETP, donc d'équivalent temps plein euh, qu'il a dans ses équipes, côté rédaction, côté tech, donc des devs, euh, back et front, et côté euh, marketing. Et donc là, on voit bien que la rédaction représente 80% des effectifs euh, des sites d'information. Donc c'est une bonne nouvelle qu'il y ait plein de journalistes. Euh, en revanche, la proportion est, euh, est une assez mauvaise nouvelle. Et euh, donc on voit le, le ratio, en gros, c'est un dev pour 7 journalistes à peu près en France parmi, parmi nos répondants. Donc on voit bien qu'il y a encore aujourd'hui un, un manque d'importance qui est donné à la tech, euh, aux équipes tech et aux équipes, aux équipes market. Euh, euh, Jean-François, vous me disiez que vous aviez la stat il y a six mois au New York Times où il y a un dev pour 2,5 journalistes, ouais, c'est ça un, un dev pour trois journalistes, et ce qu'on voit dans beaucoup d'endroits, et dont je pense que c'est un peu inévitable qu'on verra ces, ces proportions-là, euh, parce que c'est un job qui est aussi technique. Euh, je, je peux dire aussi quelque chose pour ceux qui rêvent d'être rédacteur en chef. Maintenant, un CTO, le responsable de la technologie... Euh, pour le trouver celui qu'on veut de bon niveau, on est obligé de le payer plus cher que le patron de la rédaction. 
parce que s'il n'est pas dans la presse, il va travailler dans le luxe ou dans la grande distribution. Et là, il y aura de l'argent à un niveau énorme pour arriver à le, à, à le rémunérer. Donc ce, la dimension technique du job est, devient de plus en plus prégnante. Voilà. Euh, et puis merci à tous ceux qui nous ont renseignés. Il y en a certains dans la salle et on ne dira pas qui. Et, euh, et, et vous pouvez télécharger euh, l'étude sur, euh, sur le QR code que vous voyez. Voilà. Merci. Merci. Elena Cabral. C'est rythmé, hein, je vous l'avais promis. Euh, Excusez-nous, mais comme ça, on sera à l'heure pour déjeuner. Merci. Thank you so much, Elena Cabral. She is coming from uh, Columbia Journalism School. She is a journalism educator. She is in charge of the international programs as well. Um, she will focus on uh, breaking news events uh, and the heart of reporting on TikTok. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I suppose I should say that my comments are my own and do not represent Columbia Journalism School as an institution. I tend to have strong comments and I sincerely hope I don't disappoint. I should also say that uh, we do have several centers of research and pr uh, professional practice at the Journalism School at Columbia, such as the Tau Center for Digital Journalism and the Brown Institute for Media Innovation, among others, and they tackle these issues uh, way more in depth than I ever could in these few minutes. Um, and I'd like you to To, I invite you to explore some of their publications. For my part, I, I come to you as a journalism educator, as a, a long-time um, long uh, uh, student of social media and how it changes our uh, profession and society as a whole. I'm also a former journalist. Um, My approach is generally to share how I would introduce these, these topics to students who are preparing for a career in journalism. So I'm, I'm very glad that you're all here. All of the material here uh, I've learned from other journalists and researchers whom I cite as I go along. I'd encourage you to write the names down if you're not familiar with them and to jot down the keywords. We're all, we're all very interested in keywords, right, as, uh, as people who use social media, to look up the links to the stories that I mention, and the websites, too. Um, recently, at the International Press Institute's World Congress held at Columbia University, the topic of misinformation was a central theme. It referred both to the proliferation of actual misinformation and the fact that the rise of authoritarian governments around the world, uh, that with the rise of authoritarian governments around the world, the battle cry of fake news against legitimate news sources that expose wrongdoing has sought to undercut the credibility of journalists working in the public interest, and in doing so, undercut, undercutting democratic principles. At the API conference, the executive editor of the Washington Post, uh, Sally Busby, called misinformation the issue of our, of our generation, your generation. Um, I do very much share the skepticism and concerns discussed here about TikTok and the, the, the threat that it poses to uh, privacy, to press freedoms, and to the defense of truth. Setting aside those for the moment, uh, these very real concerns, and also the intense, bitter division that it has created in our society, I'd like to explore this platform's potential to assist in the reporting of local, national, and global news but only, only if there's a reliable means of verification um, and that it's nurtured as an integral part of this process. For my bit today, I'd like to briefly touch upon some of the best known and effective examples of news gathering on TikTok, particularly in breaking news you know, that has reverberated across the globe. Journalists have the opportunity not only to join the more than one billion users, content creators, and influencers as media organizations on TikTok, but to treat this vast community of users as potentially invaluable sources, particularly when news organizations can no longer canvas communities as they once did. 
Some of my colleagues may remember when hyper local news was a thing. Um, remember when just plain local news was a thing? Uh, and let's ask ourselves why local reporting is so important. One only has to look back at the 26th uh, presidential election for why it's important to monitor, monitor this. Uh, in the days following the electoral uh, upset, journalists and po pollsters found themselves stunned that this long shot candidate, Donald Trump, defeated Hillary Clinton to become the president of the United States. You know, let us remember once again how before the election, journalists amply covered Donald Trump's behavior towards women, people with disabilities, blacks, Mexicans, uh, and others. His business practices had, had, had come under thorough scrutiny. And when the scandalous Access Hollywood tape came out, pretty much everybody had written him off. And still, he beat Hillary Clinton. Journalists on one level had to be reminded the hard way that polling data doesn't tell the whole story. It didn't quite effectively capture public sentiment on the most grassroots level, particularly among working class voters in southern states or the so-called Rust Belt states, um, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. What we now know as Trump's base wasn't really examined very carefully. TikTok and other social platforms, certainly as others have pointed out, provide a broad scope of opinions and experiences that, uh, that polls and Zoom interviews simply cannot achieve. That is quite simply because these testimonies, the opinions, the rants, and snapshots of life as it happens come directly from the source in their own words, at their own pace, uh, 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 voluntarily, and often passionately. I always tell my students that when some of these individuals ranting on social media may not be folks that you want to have a drink with, they are still voices we have to monitor and take seriously for what they represent. We certainly don't have to disseminate their thoughts by including them in articles, but take note of them for context, yes. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, a plague that affected many people from all walks of life was the great shared experience, deeply emotional, absurd at times, uh, that TikTok stepped into and found a hungry audience willing to share and discover that they weren't alone. Beyond the conspiracy theories, hateful speech, and information that was just plain wrong, you could see real people sharing how they had to say goodbye to loved ones and looking for ways, big and small, to survive. You could see also testimonies from people who once dismissed the pandemic as a government conspiracy and who came to regret it later. And yes, in between, there are plenty of silly videos that made us laugh when we really needed to. You no, know, my daughter can tell you that uh, as a journalism junkie, after you know seeing all of the horrific stories online and on television in the newspaper, sometimes it was you know hard to sleep, and so I would stay up watching TikTok and you know this particular dog in the UK that would talk to its owner and say, "Dad, Dad." Probably know which one I'm talking about. Maybe I don't know. Sophia, that does. <laughs> it was really popular um, during the summer of 2020 when most of us were holed up in our homes under quarantine. The Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, ignited once again after the death of George Floyd and remarkably altered the way TikTok was known to us in popular culture. Now TikTok was not just a showcase for dance routines and lip syncing. Suddenly videos emerged of protests, not just in major cities, but in small towns across the United States, many of them I'd never even heard of. And they weren't just protests, but sometimes they were confrontations between supporters of Black Lives Matter and diehard supporters of Donald Trump and of the police, hashtag blue lives matter. They were confessionals by people discussing their opinions, expressing their anger, and often in their vehicles for some reason, probably because the pandemic was still raging and it was the only safe place available. You know, if only for context, for background on, on hot spots of raw emotions, the myriad examples of institutionalized racism, pa passive acceptance of discrimination, and the lingering pain that goes along with it, these TikToks informed me as a, personally more than any of the news coverage that I saw. And TikTok served another purpose in, the, in this news arena too. In October 2022, the Pulitzer Prize-winning news outlet Inside Climate News declared TikTok the go-to source for real-time videos. 
during Hurricane Ian, with 1.7 million views around the hashtag Hurricane Ian. It wasn't just hurricanes, but mass shootings and other disasters that rippled across the globe. Coverage was not just limited, you know, to that TV reporter being buffeted by gale winds, um, gale force winds that has become part of our popular culture, or by the reporter standing next to a makeshift um, memorial after a, a mass shooting. There's, mu there's much more available now on platforms like TikTok that can, that when carefully verified, can tell us much more. As the pandemic waned, TikTok became part of a constellation of social media platforms that were, using, that were used in a growing field of journalistic investigations as, that's known as visual forensics, O-S-I-N-T, which stands for Open Source Intelligence. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Associated Press have all applied techniques to put together major, often award-winning investigations. These are projects that you could, as students, get involved in, or at least practice you know, in, your, in your classes. For example, videos of the deadly crush of young revelers in Itaewon, South Korea, around Halloween this year, flooded social media. These videos offered not just the first glimpse of the tragedy, but eventually a chronology an expert analysis of how the crush happened and what were the obstacles and failures in the emergency response. Though it took some time to piece together, the investigative piece published on November 16th in the Washington Post found critical lapses in the response to the stampede that killed over 150 people. If you look it up, the first images that you see under the headline, three big uh, TikTok images, uh, and they're, they, they're, they're like GIFs, they're moving. Um, they were all from TikTok. An eight minute uh, TikTok live video also helped the Washington Post piece together what happened to Al Jazeera reporter Shireen Abu Akleh when she was shot while reporting near the Jenin re refugee camp on the West Bank. It wasn't just the video, but witness test statements, audio, maps, and, of course, a reporting visit to the location uh, to show that it was likely an Israeli bullet that killed the Palestinian-American journalist, according to the Post's findings. Finally, as Valeria pointed, as illustrated so gracefully, the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces erupted onto social media, as many people have noted, in such a way that the conflict is widely known, widely has been widely dubbed the TikTok War. Again, one notable part of the phenomenon is that content creators, um, decidedly Gen X community, like Valeria's content, shared how this war unfolded. War refugees, separated families, soldiers, uh, protesters, obviously. To be sure, it was not just TikTok, but other platforms, including Telegram, that showed devastating strikes in Kyiv and other locations. Some were faked and had to be identified as such, and many others were verified as authentic. If you Google the Russia-Ukraine monitor map, you will find an example of how verification tools can be used to convey the scope of the conflict across borders without relying on uh, so much on official sources online. The monitor map is an open source effort by the Center for Information Resilience to track the conflict. Institutions like Bellingcat, GeoConfirmed, and the Conflict Intelligence Team ha have also contributed to this project, according to the website. Several of those dots that you see on the map cover Mariupol, where you know that we know that uh, a theater that uh, served as a shelter for hundreds of people before it was bombed is located. The Associated Press compiled footage using visual forensics uh, in an investigation to estimate the number of dead, which was a mystery at, the, at that point, at some 600 people. So now, on to the verification side of things. This, as we know, is an area of practice, study, and research that many see as the cornerstone of our industry as we hurtle further into the digital um, age. There's currently a wealth of websites that generously provide sources, resources and tools for journalists. Among them is First Draft News and Bellingcat. 
As a side note, the website, firstdraftnews.org, is currently migrating with one of its creators, Dr. Claire Wardle, used to be one of our uh, adjunct professors, to Brown University's Information Futures Lab. You can still find many of the first draft tools and even the exercises that you can do to practice skills like geolocating. Um, and some of these you can find on YouTube. In it, um, so in addition to people like Sofia and Francesca, Francesco, please follow Laura Garcia, an amazing journalist and social media educator who has produced many terrific explanatory videos, much of which appear on firstdraftnews.org, about how to work with TikTok as a journalist. She reinforces primary uh, checklists for verification that First News teaches. These include such things as provenance, specifically who is, uh, where did the original, where is the original video? Is it the one you're looking at uh, original, the first, or was it a repost? Second, source. Who posted that video, um, the original video? And date, not just a random date, but, but an exact date. At first glance on your TikTok post, you can generally see the, the month and the year of a post when you click on the profile of the creator and then back to the post. My daughter showed me that. But Laura Garcia's instructional video, which you can find on a handy Twitter thread, shows step-by-step -step how to find the timestamp. Spoiler alert, it involves looking at some code, but it's not scary at all when, when Garcia explains it. Journalists have to consider also location. If TikTok won't tell you the location, can the visual clues in the image tell you signs, how people are dressed, you know, landmarks, etc.? cetera? Um, you should search for videos by Maliki Brown of the New York Times that show the amazing power of Google Earth and Google, uh, and Google Maps. It's not as difficult as it looks. Um, finally, the motivation of the poster. Is there an agenda behind the posting? First Draft asks, what need does it fulfill? Finally, we can also use old-fashioned reporting tools to verify by simply looking up the user when they use their real names, which isn't often, um, or tools like LinkedIn and Google, where many users will post the same profile picture uh, or social media handle, contacting businesses and institutions around where an event has taken place is still helpful. Human beings can verify things too. Um, in closing, it should be mentioned that uh, um, one major breaking news story in which you may not have found original TikTok videos compared to, say, the Black Lives Matter protests was the eruption of, of protests in China recently in reaction to that government's COVID-19 uh, rules. But you can find collections of videos from other parties about the protests in China, videos and videos of protesters in other countries supporting their case on TikTok. So I hope that shows the power of the multitude of users documenting their stories, demanding change in places like China and Iran, and even closer to home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Et pour finir, on finit sur un panel. Rémi, vous pouvez installez-vous. Alors, Hugo au centre. Rémi là. Ok, très bien. Et bah allez. Voilà. Je vous présente pour le dernier panel de la journée Rémi Buisine, ici, reporter à Brut. Il s'occupe de toute la partie TikTok. On va pouvoir vraiment rentrer dans les détails grâce à son expertise. Hugo Travers, le fondateur de Hugo Décrypte, qui est un diplômé de Sciences Po, n'est-ce pas Mais pas de l'école de journalisme. 
euh, et, <rire> mais, et euh, Axel Bossard, euh, qui est donc le fondateur du média Spotters. En ligne, vous pouvez regarder ce qu'ils font. Donc, euh, on a choisi donc trois expertises différentes, trois profils différents pour essayer de rentrer vraiment dans le détail de comment on produit des vidéos euh, et est-ce qu'il faut y aller ou non sur TikTok. Donc l'idée déjà, on va commencer peut-être avec Rémi pour Brut puisque vous êtes le plus gros, euh, je parle du média bien sûr. Euh, <rire> 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 wow. Non, vous êtes, on a vu avec Nick Newman en début de matinée la puissance de Brut hein, en France sur TikTok. Pourquoi vous y êtes allé ben, On y est allé parce qu'il y a une évolution des usages de plus en plus. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, euh, il y a eu en parallèle aussi sur Instagram avec les Reels qui ont été lancés il y a un an. On a vu hein, une évolution de l'algorithme qui a été très changeante de passer de la photo vers la vidéo. Et surtout, en fait, le, le pari de se dire qu'en fait, sur TikTok, qui était un réseau qui jusqu'à maintenant était vu comme un réseau de divertissement, bah, il y avait vraiment la possibilité de faire de l'information, de traiter de sujets sérieux, qui a une audience qui est jeune, qui est celle qu'on veut cibler euh, sur Brut. Et donc, du coup, on y a été naturellement avec euh, l'idée de tester. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, les premières semaines, les premiers mois, bah, on a essayé de voir un peu comment l'audience réagissait, quels étaient les sujets qui marchaient, qui ne marchaient pas. Et puis au bout de quelques mois, on a trouvé un rip à partir de fin, euh, fin 2021, quoi. Enfin, on va dire dernier semestre 2021, où on a vu euh, vraiment cette évolution-là. Aussi l'envie de la plateforme TikTok de vouloir euh, gagner en, en visibilité sur ces contenus-là, c'est-à-dire de on va dire, être un peu plus sérieux sur l'information, etc., sachant qu'il y avait beaucoup de gens qui postaient aussi de fausses informations, donc il y avait un gros enjeu, qu'il y a des médias qui arrivent dessus. Et donc du coup, on y a été naturellement. C'était un virage assez... Euh, assez important parce que du coup il a fallu aussi recruter une nouvelle équipe, c'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui l'équipe qui, qui travaille sur ces formats-là c'est une toute nouvelle équipe et, et même moi-même, hein, c'est-à-dire que moi jusque-là, pendant les moi je faisais partie de l'équipe de départ à Brut il y a 6 ans, ma fonction principale elle était d'être sur le terrain, de faire des lives, etc. Je continue à le faire mais du coup Brut m'a confié la rédaction en chef donc de cette partie Combien TikTok. Combien de personnes quand vous dites équipe Alors on a 3 personnes à temps complet et on peut monter jusqu'à 6 ou 7 quand on a vraiment de gros actus. Je vais vous donner la parole aussi, mais je voudrais juste revenir sur l'intérêt de TikTok à faire de la news et à peut-être parler avec vous. Qu'est-ce que vous avez gagné en termes de peut-être visibilité, de rémunération, du fait de pouvoir alimenter leur, leur axe de développement Alors, il faut être clair sur la rémunération. Aujourd'hui, on n'est pas encore éligible. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a des fonds qui sont mis en place pour les créateurs. Donc, où il y a un nombre de vues, vous êtes rémunéré au nombre de vues. Donc, pour l'instant, on l'a pas encore. C'est-à-dire que là, euh, c'est une Même opération... quand on est le plus gros en France sur TikTok, on n'a ah, pour... aucune rémunération. Pour, pour, pour l'instant, alors ça va venir. On sait que euh, eux, en tout cas, nous promettent une évolution pour début 2023. Mais aujourd'hui, on ne gagne pas d'argent sur TikTok. Autant on a d'autres plateformes. Aujourd'hui, on gagne de l'argent. C'est avec Facebook, YouTube, Snap aussi, qui est très rentable de ce côté-là. Mais sur TikTok, c'est pas encore le cas. Mais euh, nous, l'idée, c'est euh, d'être euh, euh, précurseur, c'est-à-dire que si on attend à chaque fois les monétisations, il y a 6 ans euh, il n'y avait pas de monétisation du peur quasiment et si on attendait, bah, il y en a d'autres qui vont euh, prendre le fil et puis après vous, êtes, vous arrivez en retard donc euh, nous on a voulu arriver fin 2021 dessus, créer notre propre audience, créer nos contenus et puis après avec le temps euh, la monétisation viendra Merci, Hugo Travers, vous vous êtes lancé au départ sur Youtube et maintenant Et maintenant sur, notamment sur TikTok, euh, ça a été un peu la même réflexion je pense que pour, euh, que pour Brut quand ça a vraiment émergé en 2020 pour nous, c'était un peu une évidence qu'il fallait essayer de tenter des choses sur TikTok, alors qu'à l'époque, c'était une plateforme même décriée par les youtubeurs eux-mêmes, qui disaient que c'est une plateforme pour des jeunes, un peu ridicule, où il y avait de la musique et pas grand-chose d'autre. Et, euh, et moi, j'ai toujours aimé me dire, euh, oui, aujourd'hui, c'est une plateforme qui fait ça, mais concrètement, c'est une plateforme où il y a des jeunes, où il y a des règles du jeu qui sont différentes de YouTube ou d'Instagram ou autre. Et euh, si on arrive à utiliser ces règles-là pour amener de l'information sur cette plateforme-là auprès d'un public jeune, bah, c'est un défi qui est assez, euh, assez stimulant et donc... On a commencé comme ça en 2020, c'était pas évident, enfin, on s'est un peu cassé la gueule pendant un an et demi et c'est pareil, je pense c'est fin à la rentrée 2021 que ça a commencé à vraiment, vraiment grandir, on est passé de, ouais, de 200 000 à plus de 3,3 millions d'abonnés aujourd'hui et, et c'est vraiment, je pense, un... c'est aussi partir du principe que chaque plateforme va avoir cette évolution là. Euh, Instagram au début c'était que de la photo, au fur et à mesure ça s'est élargi à d'autres thématiques, notamment l'information. YouTube c'est la même chose, c'était du divertissement surtout au départ et maintenant euh, tous les médias quasiment sont sur euh, YouTube. TikTok je pense que ça va suivre le même chemin et pour nous étant donné qu'on s'adresse surtout à un public qui est jeune, ça nous semblait un peu une évidence de, de travailler sur cette plateforme là et, et de produire du contenu d'information sur euh, TikTok. Je reste un petit peu avec, avec vous, Hugo, Hugo euh, sur euh, qu'est-ce que vous avez à désappris, qu'est-ce que vous avez défait de YouTube pour mettre sur TikTok 
Euh, je pense qu'il faut quasiment tout désapprendre. C'est-à-dire qu'on peut être très bon sur YouTube et très mauvais sur TikTok. Et inversement, c'est des plateformes qui sont euh, radicalement différentes. Et c'est ce qui fait même que... C'est un avis strictement personnel, mais au sein des, des rédactions aujourd'hui, le fait d'avoir des journalistes social media ou réseaux sociaux n'a plus trop de sens parce que c'est à l'intérieur même de ces réseaux sociaux, il y a des différences assez fondamentales. Et nous-mêmes, au sein de l'équipe, on a certaines formes de spécifications par thématique, comme on peut avoir dans d'autres rédacts, mais on a surtout des spécificités par par format, parce qu'on a des personnes qui sont meilleures sur TikTok, qui passent leur journée ou leur nuit sur TikTok et qui, du coup, savent comment utiliser cette plateforme pour en faire du, du contenu d'information. Donc, euh, oui, je pense que ça implique aussi pour les rédactions de, de, de se transformer, de faire en sorte d'être euh, vigilant là-dessus. Et pourquoi est-ce qu'on dit ça Parce que, typiquement, euh, nous, on a essayé de mettre notre format d'actu du jour qu'on fait sur YouTube et en podcast sur TikTok. Ça n'a pas fonctionné. Euh, et euh, inversement, des contenus qu'on ferait sur... Euh, sur TikTok ne fonctionne pas sur YouTube. La seule différence, que, la seule distinction que je ferais, c'est sur euh, ces formats courts en tant que tels. Euh, on posait la question pourquoi aller sur TikTok En réalité, on parle d'aller sur TikTok, mais on parle d'aller plus largement, je pense, sur des formats courts. Aujourd'hui, euh, je pense que tous les TikTok qu'on poste, on peut aussi les poster en Reels sur Instagram, on peut aussi les poster en Shorts sur YouTube. Et globalement, ça marche assez bien aussi sur les autres plateformes comme ça. Donc, euh, plus largement, je pense que la thématique, c'est d'investir sur ces formats courts parce qu'ils pourront être sur YouTube, mais aussi sur d'autres euh, réseaux. Axel Bossard, donc vous, vous travaillez pour le média Spotters, euh, donc on a compris, globalement vous voulez tous y aller, vous y êtes déjà, mais à quelles conditions, quelles sont les réussites, euh, les leviers pour cette réussite sur, euh, sur TikTok par exemple Je pense que l'un des leviers primordiaux sur TikTok c'est avoir une certaine, on va dire, un bon rythme de publication. Euh, pour le coup, c'est quelque chose d'assez important euh, sur la plateforme, c'est quelque chose qui est très mis en avant. C'est comme un peu sur YouTube, hein, il faut euh, réussir à avoir un certain rythme avec, euh, si on arrive à se tenir à une vi des vidéos par jour, bah, continuer à le faire. Vous diriez euh, combien, combien par jour Alors, on est, en fait, ce qui est intéressant sur la plateforme, c'est qu'il n'y a pas forcément de, 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 de formule magique où euh, si tu publies un contenu par jour ou six par jour, tu vas être plus mis en avant. En fait, ce qui est important, c'est si tu fais un contenu par semaine, eh bien, un contenu par semaine doit être publié et là, l'algorithme va te reconnaître et dire « Ok, cette personne est investie sur ma, sur, ma, sur ma plateforme, cette personne euh, publie du contenu sur euh, on va dire un rythme qui est habituel et qui va euh, on va dire, euh, permettre aux utilisateurs de se reconnaître un peu dedans et de le suivre. Euh... » C'est la régularité. C'est ça, c'est avoir une régularité. Il faut faire un sprint et après un marathon. C'est ça, euh, la régularité c'est quelque chose d'assez important. Euh, et je pense qu'aussi, il faut vraiment étudier beaucoup sur TikTok le... le, le tout ce qui va être l'engagement le, potentiel des utilisateurs, c'est-à-dire faire en sorte que le contenu soit commenté, c'est très important, mais aussi qu'il soit partagé. Euh, pour le coup, les partages internes à la plateforme sont euh, extrêmement importants aussi parce que euh, bah, ça permet en fait aux gens de se reconnecter dessus. Euh, quand on reçoit un, une notification, on va se reconnecter sur la plateforme et du coup, potentiellement, on va aller euh, checker notre feed. Et du coup, le partage en messagerie privée est quelque chose d'important aussi euh, à, euh, à noter, donc euh, typiquement euh, envoie cette vidéo à tes amis, euh, ça on l'a vu plein de fois sur TikTok, alors ça ne fonctionne pas forcément pour les médias mais euh, typiquement euh, c'est quelque chose qui permettra de gagner en visibilité et euh, peut-être le dernier point c'est aussi le fait de consommer le contenu en entier et surtout euh, plusieurs fois, ça pour le coup c'est quelque chose que la plateforme met aussi beaucoup en avant euh, comme sur euh, Youtube, hein, le temps de visionnage est extrêmement important, même si on est sur du contenu court, le fait de rester tout le long du contenu, bah, ça va faire en sorte que la vidéo sera plus, en plus mise en avant également. Et, euh, et euh, globalement, euh, si vous la regardez plusieurs fois, c'est encore mieux. C'est pour ça qu'il y a des personnes qui euh, font ce qu'on appelle des, des loops, c'est-à-dire que la fin de la vidéo euh, si, correspond au début et du coup tu peux regarder la vidéo en boucle et euh, ça permet du coup de... Des fois, tu te retrouves piégé dans une vidéo, ça fait euh, 30 secondes que tu la regardes et tu te rends, tu te rends compte que c'est euh, <rire> qu en fait, fait, la même chose. Quoi. Mais comment vous faites pour mieux connaître les audiences qui s'engagent avec vous sur TikTok puisque on a compris hein, à la fin de cette matinée, on n'a pas accès à euh, bah, des statistiques intéressantes. Euh, tout à l'heure, on a eu l'étude Techstack qui dit euh, finalement, il y a très peu d'outils euh, qui peuvent être implémentés de façon industrielle dans des rédactions pour suivre ce qui se passe sur TikTok, pour multi-publier, euh, multi etc. Vous le faites donc à la main, individuellement Alors, on a, on a une équipe data pour ça, mais on a aussi des statistiques quand même, qui ne sont peut-être pas forcément hyper précises, mais qui donnent quand même les tranches d'âge, les villes d'où vous êtes regardées. Et après, il y a aussi des analyses qu'on fait euh, par plateforme. C'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, 
on s'est rendu compte qu'on a, enfin, on a des équipes différentes par plateforme parce qu'en fait, on se rend compte qu'on ne parle pas du tout au même public. Mmh. C'est-à-dire que les gens qui nous suivent sur Snap ne sont pas du tout les mêmes que sur TikTok et éditorialement, on ne traite pas du tout des mêmes sujets. Mais quand on ne dit pas les mêmes, c'est quoi c'est... Une différence fondamentale de culture en vrai entre les plateformes. C'est ça oui. qui est important à noter. C'est Mais ce n'est pas plateforme... une question d'âge, ce n'est pas une question de géolocalisation, plus les ruraux, plus le... si, les peut. villes. Qu'est-ce, bah, que, Snap, qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait donner Snap comme exemple Snap est beaucoup plus urbain. Euh, TikTok, et TikTok et Facebook, là où il peut y avoir une proximité, non pas sur les âges, mais c'est assez rural. Euh, en réalité, euh, plus qu'on pense. Et au niveau de l'âge, c'est un petit peu plus âgé qu'on pourrait le penser aussi. Et c'est une plateforme qui cherche aussi à... En fait, le, l'enjeu de toutes les plateformes, c'est d'aller chercher des gens qui ont plus de 18 ans parce que eux, ils ont envie de les monétiser. Donc leur enjeu, il est aussi là. C'est aussi pour ça qu'ils ont voulu avoir des acteurs de l'information qui arrivent. Donc on analyse par plateforme et aujourd'hui, on se rend compte... C'est-à-dire que moi, je me souviens, quand on a lancé Brut il y a 6 ans, on postait les contenus les mêmes partout. Aujourd'hui, on ferait ça, ce serait une énorme connerie. Parce qu'on se rend compte que, par exemple, un contenu, il est perçu d'une certaine façon sur TikTok. Et sur Instagram, l'écriture ne serait pas mmh. du tout bonne. Et vous mettez un Reels sur, euh, sur Twitter, mais vous allez vous faire démonter par la moitié des gens. <rire> Donc, du coup, l'idée, c'est qu'on a vraiment réfléchi à essayer d'avoir une stratégie par, par plateforme avec des équipes dédiées. Et ce qui fait qu'en fait, la conf de rédac le matin, il euh, bah, y a plusieurs confs de rédac à Brut. En fait, il n'y en a pas une seule. Il y en a une pour le service reportage. Il y en a une pour les stories, ce qu'on appelle donc euh, Snap, Instagram, story, euh, Insta et Snap. Et une pour les formats courts. Et euh, format long, euh, les décryptages, on l'a fait ensemble. Donc ça fait trois confs de rédac différentes le, le matin parce que l'évolution des plateformes fait qu'aujourd'hui, il y en a de plus en plus et des audiences qui sont vraiment très différentes. Et c'est aussi l'enjeu à chaque fois qu'il y a une nouvelle plateforme de l'investir. C'est-à-dire que si, on, si par exemple, on, on, on revient sur la question de départ, si on n'avait pas investi TikTok il y a un an et demi, bah, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, ça aurait été une grave erreur stratégique pour Brut. Euh, Brut et d'autres, enfin, je veux dire pour Hugo, pareil. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a l'enjeu à chaque fois... Ok, on a la chance d'être un média qui est suivi, mais si vous ne pensez pas au coût d'avance et à l'évolution des usages sur les réseaux, bah vous êtes mort. Et, deux ans, et en deux ans, il y en a d'autres qui prennent votre place. Donc à chaque fois, vous êtes en perpétuelle réflexion à réfléchir sur les usages, les formats et à avoir tout le temps coup d'avance sur les autres. Sinon, euh, bah sinon voilà, il hein, y en a d'autres qui le font à votre place. <rire> Axel, vous vouliez dire aussi que dans les différences, il y a des histoires de culture, de ouais. code. Est-ce qu'on peut essayer de, de le définir bah, Ça tombe bien parce que justement, c'est tout le sujet de notre média spotter, c'est de, d'explorer la culture des réseaux sociaux et de ce qui se fait sur les plateformes. On va dire que sur Internet, il y a des réseaux sociaux qui sont des très gros générateurs de ce qu'on appelle de la culture Internet. Alors, culture Internet, il n'y en a pas qu'une seule et c'est justement là qu'on touche la particularité de ces réseaux. C'est-à-dire que Twitter va être un très gros générateur de culture web, TikTok aussi, euh, en tout cas pour la France. Mais typiquement, on a aussi des, euh, des plateformes internationales comme Reddit qui touchent moins la France, mais qui sont aussi des gros générateurs eux-mêmes. Et en fait, ces plateformes-là, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que parce qu'elles génèrent une culture, elles vont fidéliser énormément leurs audiences, ce qui fait que les personnes qu'on retrouve sur Twitter vont généralement, et qui sont les plus gros consommateurs de Twitter, je parle bien, vont généralement ne consommer que ce réseau-là. Euh, et pareil pour TikTok, c'est des personnes qui vont être exclusivement quasiment sur ces plateformes-là et qui vont partager ces codes-là, parce que c'est des codes qui sont, qui sont on va dire, euh, nulle part ailleurs que sur d'autres réseaux. Et euh, c'est pour ça qu'il est important justement, et c'est pour ça qu'on parle d'usage et des, de, on va dire d'évolution des usages, c'est que ces usages, ils évoluent énormément au sein des communautés, puisque c'est, c'est des cultures qui évoluent et qui sont propres à ces plateformes. Le fait que vous ne puissiez pas renvoyer et de faire de link out euh, depuis, euh, depuis TikTok, euh, vous en avez fait votre deuil euh, Effectivement, ce n'est pas facile de, de faire en sorte que des gens qui nous suivent sur TikTok euh, aillent sur YouTube ou autre, parce que ce n'est pas les mêmes plateformes, donc déjà, ce n'est pas évident et ce n'est pas non, notamment les mêmes, les mêmes formats. Euh, nous, ça fonctionne dans certains cas. On voit que, par exemple, sur Instagram, on a quand même bien grandi grâce à TikTok. Est-ce que les gens nous suivent, nous sont beaucoup suivis sur la dernière année sur, sur TikTok On mentionne assez souvent en fait, notre compte Instagram dessus. Et forcément, on a, on a passé une milliard de vues sur TikTok en un an et on a parlé pas mal de fois dans ces, dans ces vidéos-là de, d'Instagram. Donc on a vu que ça a ramené beaucoup de gens dessus. YouTube, c'est plus dur. Mais c'est intéressant justement de voir dans ce cas le cas de Shorts. Parce que Shorts, du coup, c'est, euh, alors, c'est utilisé de plus en plus en France déjà. Euh, et ce lien entre des formats Shorts et des formats YouTube, ce sera peut-être plus facile à faire. Et on peut imaginer qu'à terme, euh, bah, YouTube mette en place un système qui permette de créer des fiches ou autre pour que euh, je regarde un extrait d'une interview de, d'un artiste ou d'un politique. Et euh, rapidement, je peux avoir la vidéo plus longue sur la chaîne de, euh, du média. Donc il euh, y a des synergies comme ça qui sont intéressantes. Et je pense d'ailleurs que ce sera peut-être plus facile pour YouTube de passer, d'intégrer les formats courts que pour TikTok d'intégrer des formats longs, parce que je pense que c'est plus dur d'avoir une plateforme qui fonctionne sur des formats longs avec des créateurs de contenu qui ont intérêt à en faire. Et ça, c'est aussi le cas pour les médias. Donc, euh, c'est assez intéressant. Hein. Non, moi, sur TikTok, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'il y a la fonctionnalité live qui se développe aussi ouais. beaucoup, pour le coup. Et oui. ça, c'est un vrai challenger aujourd'hui
chercher. Il <rire> euh, y a deux personnes à temps plein et une personne à, à mi-temps dessus. Et pareil, c'était nécessaire. C'est-à-dire que, en fait, c'est des formats qui prennent tellement de temps et en production, mais aussi même en réflexion. Et en fait, on peut mettre plus de temps à faire un format d'une minute sur TikTok que faire un format de cinq minutes sur euh, YouTube. Et le contenu bref pour ne pas partir sur quelque chose de biaisé, pour ne pas partir sur quelque chose qui, euh, qui donne des, des, des mauvaises idées ou autres, ça peut prendre beaucoup de temps, donc c'est pas forcément évident et c'était nécessaire, je pense, d'avoir cette, cette équipe-là. Ouais. Le, le problème du scroll, enfin, problème ou non, euh, comment vous l'utilisez à votre profit Donc on a parlé de, du phénomène de, de boucle. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire d'autre d'intelligent euh, pour rester sur de l'info et avec ce scroll Qu'est-ce que vous avez développé comme pratique alors, il y a l'intelligence de se dire qu'il faut penser aux trois premières secondes, c'est-à-dire l'intro de la vidéo. Mais quand je dis l'intelligence, c'est en même temps, il faut que les trois premières secondes donnent envie de rester. Mais euh, ça revient euh, sur un phénomène qu'on voit, qui a souvent été critiqué dans la presse écrite, qui est celui de la titraille, qui est parfois, en fait, vous avez un titre ravageur, et puis en fait, le contenu ne dit pas du tout la même chose. Donc moi, je pense qu'il y a un truc qui est important, c'est de trouver un équilibre alors, en ayant une accroche qui soit bonne, qui soit forte, qui donne envie aux gens de regarder, mais qui permet à la fois de garder le lien de confiance avec son audience. C'est-à-dire que si vous donnez un titre et que le contenu parce que moi j'ai déjà vu ça, hein. des, des fois vous avez le titre et puis le contenu derrière, c'est très éloigné. Bah, vous, vous éloignez votre audience de votre média parce que le lien de confiance, la personne a peut-être regardé toute la vidéo, mais à la fin il y a un phénomène déceptif. Et notre responsabilité en tant que journaliste, c'est de réfléchir comment à ce que les gens n'aient pas trop le, le fait de, de zapper tout le temps, mais en même temps que le, 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 le titre corresponde à la vidéo. Donc c'est une réflexion qu'on a tous les jours, donc le, le, le début de la vidéo, puis après c'est des montages qui sont assez dynamiques en termes d'image. Euh, euh, on peut prendre par exemple... Euh, un exemple d'accroche, par exemple, quand vous faites une curation d'un un, un politique, la, la curation elle va peut-être durer euh, 3 minutes, bah, vous allez faire ce qu'on appelle une fausse ouverture, avec euh, les 10 secondes peut-être les plus impactantes, euh, qui est un extrait, mais qui va donner aussi au, mais envie là, aux gens. 3. 3 minutes <rire> Mais on peut. 3 secondes. Euh, même pas mais, bah, après, 10 secondes, ça marche, parce que, je veux dire, les 3 premières secondes, c'est quand c'est sur un sujet, euh, mais quand c'est une, une accroche. Euh, je veux dire, même si ça dure 10-15 secondes, les gens peuvent rester, puis on se rend compte que les rétentions d'audience sont plutôt bonnes. Hein. Enfin, je veux dire, euh, dans les statistiques, on a quand même des choses qui permettent de montrer la rétention d'audience du début à la fin de la vidéo. Et on voit qu'en moyenne, on arrive à avoir euh, à peu près 25 à 40% des gens qui vont jusqu'au bout des vidéos. Ce qui est quand même pas mal, et ce qui est un équivalent même parfois supérieur à d'autres plateformes. Donc c'est plutôt, euh, plutôt encourageant. Et puis, on parle des trois premières secondes, mais il y a aussi le fait de se dire qu'aujourd'hui, parce que c'est vrai qu'on réduit beaucoup TikTok à se dire « c'est du court, du court, du court ». Mais en réalité, ça l'est de moins en moins. Euh, il y a un an, TikTok, c'était 1 minute 30. Aujourd'hui, on peut mettre jusqu'à 10 minutes. Et on voit qu'on a un enjeu à côté des, des formats courts qu'on fait justement, parfois d'une minute 30, deux minutes. Les Reels, par exemple, sont passés de 60 secondes à 90 secondes. Les reportages, on a des, des très bons scores sur les reportages, des reportages qui parfois durent 5 minutes et on va avoir des scores de 1 million, 1 million 5 de vues. Donc on voit aujourd'hui ces plateformes-là qui ont envie de favoriser le long. D'ailleurs, on le voit même parce que je sais que vous, vous êtes éligible au, mmh. au fonds de, de revenus où les médias ne le sont pas encore. Mmh. Euh, les, les vidéos qui sont rémunérées sont des vidéos supérieures à 1 minute. Donc en gros, TikTok veut aussi encourager les créateurs et les médias à faire des formats plus longs. Donc il faut dire format court, mais il y a quand même pas mal de nuances derrière. Alors vous, vous touchez ouais. euh, depuis le, ouais. grâce au fond, c'est ça Exactement. Alors c'est combien à peu près pour C'est très bien. Euh, c'est moins bien que ce qui... Non, parce que le chiffre qui a beaucoup circulé sur les, sur les réseaux, c'était 1 dollar ou 1 euro, je ne sais plus, pour 1000 vues. Ce n'est pas du tout ça. C'est-à-dire que dans notre cas, c'est beaucoup moins. Euh, mais c'est bien pour autant. Parce on, fait... on peut dire un peu le... On n'a pas de fourchette qu'on peut, qu peut malheureusement ah donner, bon euh, donner comme ça. Mais c'est intéressant pour nous parce que ça, ouais, ça monétise bien vu l'audience qu'on fait aujourd'hui. Euh, là, si on fait, euh, on fait près de 50 millions de vues par... Euh, je ne sais plus si c'est par semaine ou par mois en ce moment. Donc ça grandit bien forcément. Euh, et et c'est intéressant pour nous. Et, et juste pour rebondir là-dessus sur la, la question de la durée moyenne de visionnage, justement ce programme-là, il est sur les vidéos qui font plus d'une minute, comme le disait Rémi. Et pour nous, ça pose des questions euh, stratégiquement qui sont assez, euh, assez intéressantes. Parce que jusqu'ici, on se disait, il y a les formats courts et il y a les formats longs, pour dire les choses euh, très rapidement. Et là, on se retrouve dans une situation où TikTok veut pousser et monétise les formats de plus d'une minute. De l'autre côté, on a euh, les Reels et les Shorts qui font moins d'une minute. Donc, on a une situation un peu bizarre. Et, en, et par ailleurs, comme tu le dis, Rémi, il y a des, des formats plus longs qu'on peut poster qui peuvent faire euh, 3-4 minutes et faire des millions de vues sur TikTok. Je vais Donc, poser euh... ma question autrement. Est-ce que vos 1,5 ETP, presque 2, sont financés par le fonds Nos 1,5, pardon vos, vos ETP, là, vos, le, les personnes qui travaillent oui. sur les... Oui, ils sont, financés par le fond. ils sont financés par le fonds. Et oui, il vous en reste encore Oui. Okay. Ouais. Non, non, c'est intéressant. Alors après, j'ai un doute sur la capacité de TikTok à maintenir ce programme, dans le sens où je... 
il rémunère très bien et, et, ça, et surtout il est visible pour quasiment tout le monde c'est à dire que vous pouvez avoir euh, fait un peu de vues sur TikTok avant et vous lancer euh, avec ce programme de monétisation et directement toucher euh, pas mal d'argent. Donc j'ai un doute sur le fait qu'ils vont le maintenir tel qu'il est. S'ils le maintiennent, tant mieux, mais euh, j'ai un ouais. peu un doute là-dessus. Il y a un doute, c'est un peu comme quand, euh, je sais pas, Bolt se lance en France, vous mettez des offres ouais. très attractives pour avoir les clients. Mmh. Donc là, en gros, c'est d'essayer de ramener le maximum de créateurs. Puis après, quand ils sont tous là, bah, vous taillez devant. Comme YouTube, il y a quelques années, mmh. hein, on se souvient, il y a 10 ans, quand YouTube s'est lancé, c'était la poule aux œufs d'or. Il y avait des centaines d'euros par, euh, par centaines de milliers de vues, c'était parfait. Et aujourd'hui, vous avez la moitié des vidéos qui sont strikées quand. Euh, ça ne convient pas au contenu, donc c'est assez, euh, assez compliqué. Et en plus de ça, euh, Shorts lance son programme de monétisation en janvier ou février, je crois, euh, ouais. en France en tout cas. Et donc, il euh, y aura une sorte de concurrence qu'on a pour quasiment la première fois. J'ai l'impression que sur un format précis, qui est ce côté format court d'environ une minute, on a toutes les plateformes qui essaient de se positionner pour faire en sorte que euh, le contenu soit d'abord sur la plateforme avant d'être sur, euh, sur les autres. Je vais passer peut-être euh, le questionnement aussi à la salle, mais en, en attendant que vous leviez la main, je voudrais, parce que ce matin, on a beaucoup parlé des takeaways et ce qu'on peut retenir, mais on peut aussi éluder d'autres choses qui, euh, que vous auriez testées. Qu'est-ce qu'il ne faut surtout pas faire, à votre sens, aujourd'hui, euh, décembre 2022 Le non takeaway à, à dire, on va dire. Ne pas incarner. <rire> ne pas incarner, déjà. C'est euh, la pire erreur possible, je pense, sur TikTok. Si on ne montre pas son visage, si on est juste une voix off et tout. Enfin, euh, ça dépend. Le des, manque d'incarnation. Il faut de l'incarnation sur TikTok. <rire> C'est clairement euh, un enjeu principal, je pense. Euh. Ouais, je suis d'accord. Enfin, sur l'incarnation, euh, nous, mais on ce a... un deuxième quand même. Oui, non, mais je, je, je dirais autre chose. <rire> <rire> mais ce qui est marrant, c'est qu'on a. Moi, j'ai commencé à incarner de moins en moins de contenu sur TikTok. C'est-à-dire que maintenant, il y a une partie de l'équipe qui incarne les contenus qu'on fait, plus de la moitié aujourd'hui, et on a les mêmes euh, audiences que si c'était moi. Donc, euh, ça prouve qu'on peut aussi euh, faire en sorte de diversifier l'incarnation euh, là-dessus, et ça fonctionne bien aussi de temps en temps en voix off. Ouais. Euh, non, sur les choses à faire ou pas faire. Donc, ne pas juste prendre des contenus qu'on a sur euh, YouTube ou autre. Et à l'inverse, chose à faire, on parlait de la rétention sur les vidéos. C'est peut-être l'élément le plus important à regarder. Vous regardez si les gens euh, euh, regardent votre vidéo jusqu'au bout. Et autant il y a plein de choses, il y a un désalignement entre les intérêts des plateformes et les intérêts des médias. Autant sur ce cas précis, je trouve ça finalement euh, assez sain qu'on regarde si les gens re consomment, regardent notre vidéo jusqu'au bout, s'ils décrochent au bout de la cinquième seconde. Euh, et donc je pense que c'est l'élément le plus important pour euh, réussir sur euh, TikTok. Et je dirais globalement ne pas poster son contenu sur toutes les plateformes, comme je disais tout à l'heure, de vraiment réfléchir parce que quand vous postez un contenu pour TikTok, il peut être très mal perçu sur Instagram. Des fois, on a déjà vu une vidéo qu'on met sur TikTok, sur Instagram, les commentaires au bout de quelques minutes, il n'y a pas la même compréhension. Et sur Twitter, alors là, c'est vraiment encore autre, un autre monde. Hein. De toute façon, c'est un univers parallèle de Twitter. Donc, il y a cette réflexion-là. Et puis, de toute façon, on est obligé d'y penser parce que... En fait, là, on a une complication tous les jours. C'est que, par exemple, les Reels sur Facebook doivent faire moins de 60 secondes. Sur Instagram, 90. Mmh. Sur TikTok, c'est libre. Et sur YouTube, j'ai plus la durée exacte, mais plus c'est court, mieux c'est. Donc c'est euh, la complication, mais d'un côté, c'est ce qui permet aussi de, de réfléchir à, à bien adapter les contenus par plateforme et à se dire, est-ce que éditorialement, la perception de notre contenu va vraiment marcher sur cette plateforme-là Parce que ça arrive bien souvent que ce n'est pas le cas. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions dans la salle pour nos trois invités Je suis sûr qu'on n'a pas tout questionné. On a été chiant à mourir. Du coup. <rire> Je suis optimiste, oui. on a tout dit. <rire> Bonjour. Euh, ce matin, on a beaucoup parlé des synergies entre les différents réseaux sociaux. Euh, on voit que justement tout le monde se pose la question de comment on fait cohabiter TikTok avec d'autres plateformes. Mais on n'a pas parlé de Twitch notamment. Et on voit que Twitch aujourd'hui, c'est quand même euh, un lien avec TikTok, notamment avec certains streamers qui gagnent énormément en visibilité auprès de nouvelles audiences. Est-ce que c'est le cas aussi pour les médias Tu veux commencer il n'y a pas beaucoup de médias qui sont sur Twitch, non. en vrai, déjà, donc euh, c'est complexe. Mais il me semble que des médias comme Popcorn, par exemple, font des bonnes vues sur, euh, sur la plateforme. Donc l'enjeu va être surtout d'identifier les moments les plus divertissants, j'ai l'impression, souvent, euh, de l'émission et ensuite les, les, les reposter. Euh, et puis... Euh, ouais. Ouais, non, je pense que c'est une excellente question et un excellent point. C'est vrai que la synergie euh, Reels, Shorts, TikTok, elle est évidente. Celle sur Twitch est peut-être moins connue. Et pour que tout le monde ait le contexte, il y a énormément de streamers qui ont émergé grâce à TikTok. Et moi-même, je pense que ces derniers jours, je passe plus de temps à regarder du Twitch sur TikTok, mmh. ce qui est assez particulier. Euh, et, et je pense que c'est une strat des streamers aujourd'hui qui, du coup, mettent tout leur contenu sur TikTok, parfois dans la seconde. Mais même maintenant, c'est là où c'est intéressant. Il y, a une, il y a du contenu généré par des des abonnés, des gens qui suivent les différents streamers, euh, qui se fait là-dessus, c'est-à-dire qu'on va avoir un live d'un euh, streamer, euh, Amine par exemple, et dans la seconde, si Amine dit quelque chose lors de son live, 
dans la seconde, on est sûr que cet extrait euh, marquant, il sera sur TikTok parce qu'il euh, y a des centaines ou des mmh. milliers de, de, de jeunes qui veulent potentiellement être la personne qui a fait diffuser cet extrait sur TikTok. Euh, pour les médias, je pense que c'est peu exploité aujourd'hui. Euh, parce qu'on est peu sur euh, Twitch, nous on a fait une pause euh, sur Twitch en ce moment et, et en général je pense que les médias sont peu dessus. Mais à voir s'il n'y a pas des synergies à terme qui sont possibles, les Popcorn euh, le fait très bien par exemple. J'ai une question aussi peut-être pour les, les étudiants là, qui vont bientôt intégrer le marché du travail. Euh, si vous recrutez pour euh, produire ce type de contenu euh, pour TikTok, vous cherchez quel type de profil, quelles compétences, qu'est-ce qui vous séduirait <rire> voilà. euh, alors moi, je donnerais peut-être un, un, peut un conseil, parce que c'est vrai que souvent, on reçoit euh, le, le traditionnel lettre de motivation CV. Et très souvent, euh, quand on voit la lettre de motivation, on se dit, il y a juste le nom du média qui a été changé. Et c'est vrai que derrière, il n'y a pas forcément... Euh, et ce n'est pas forcément sur cette capacité-là qu'on peut réussir à voir euh, quelles sont euh, les capacités du journaliste. Parce que euh, d'avoir fait un stage à tel ou tel endroit, ce n'est pas ça qui va être déterminant en réalité. Euh, ce qui va être déterminant, c'est plutôt quelles sont vos idées. Enfin, moi, je, par exemple, quand... Quand on va recruter une nouvelle personne, je me dis qu'est-ce que cette personne va apporter en plus à notre rédaction quelles, va, quelles vont être ses idées Quelles vont être euh, euh, voilà sa valeur ajoutée par rapport à ce qu'on a déjà L'idée, c'est qu'en fait, on a envie d'avoir une rédaction qui soit complémentaire. On a tous des sujets un peu de prédilection dans la rédac, et ce qui fait que le matin, c'est très euh, voilà chacun un peu ses idées, ses sujets de prédilection, et c'est assez fluide. Et donc avoir des gens voilà qui peuvent apporter quelque chose, des idées, se dire bah voilà moi j'arriverai en conférence de rédaction ce matin, je proposerai ça. Et c'est vrai que c'est une question parfois qu'on pose en entretien. Bah voilà si tu étais avec nous ce matin, qu'est-ce que tu aurais proposé et c'est là où on imagine bah, vraiment cette personne en étant avec nous concrètement comment ça se passerait. Et je trouve que c'est beaucoup plus fort que, euh, que d'arriver avec un CV, une lettre de motivation. Puis après, il y a un truc qui est hyper important, je dirais, c'est la, la curiosité des nouveaux formats, l'éveil face à l'actualité, euh, d'être au courant de ce qui se passe. Euh, on, on, on le voit notamment euh, quand, on, quand on propose à, à des gens de, 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 de faire de nouveaux formats, c'est qu'ils essayent de, de, de construire quelque chose de différent, c'est-à-dire d'essayer d'avoir encore le coup d'avance. Euh, moi, je le vois, je l'ai je vu par exemple par rapport à des gens qui étaient en école. Euh, quand ils étaient en école, ils ont... Euh, euh, pardon, j'ai un peu perdu mon truc, mais... Euh... Vous avez l'impression que c'est trop formaté, c'est pas une nouvelle ouais, narration, voilà, c'est ça C'est ça que je voulais dire. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, il y a une notion, c'est-à-dire en fait, à l'étude, il, il y a le côté parfois... Oui, évidemment, ça ne s'adresse pas. <rire> c'est pour, pour, pour ça que j'avais du mal peut-être un peu à l'exprimer. C'est-à-dire que parfois, on repose beaucoup de choses sur l'école. Alors qu'en 6 ans, j'ai eu la chance d'aller dans pas mal d'écoles, de discuter avec beaucoup d'étudiants. Et ce qui leur permet souvent d'avoir le coup d'avance, c'est quand vous allez explorer un nouveau format, quand vous allez même, même créer des formats déjà existants. C'est-à-dire que vous allez créer un média étudiant en allant faire des reportages, en allant interviewer des gens. Bah, quand demain, vous postulez, vous, vous... moi, j'aime bien quand on reçoit, par exemple, un site où on voit des reportages, la personne qui a été sur le terrain. Moi, j'ai vu aussi à l'époque, quand moi, j'avais couvert bah, le, le mouvement des Gilets jaunes, il y avait beaucoup de, de journalistes sur le terrain que j'étais intervenu à l'ESG Lille, il y a plein de journalistes qui me disaient, enfin de, de jeunes étudiants qui disaient, on veut y aller. Bah moi je leur disais, bah allez-y. Alors leur, leur école était un peu... Mais en fait la réalité c'est que ceux qui sont allés sur le terrain, ils ont pris un coup d'avance parce qu'il y a la théorie qui est à l'école et la pratique, c'est la réalité de la vie, la réalité du terrain qui vous permet euh, bah voilà, de vous confronter au réel, vous créez vos propres réseaux sociaux. Donc derrière, en créant ses propres réseaux, bah, on poste ses contenus. Moi, j'ai même vu des étudiants qui vendaient même leurs propres images à des médias et qui, du coup, avaient des contacts avec des Red Chef. Et puis, euh, voilà, quand vous postulez, bah, vous avez déjà des contenus, des reportages qui sont faits. Et, et je pense que c'est hyper important. Juste si je peux ajouter une ou deux choses là-dessus sur le, le recrutement, et notamment dans le cas des formats courts comme TikTok. Euh, effectivement, les critères ne sont pas forcément les mêmes. Nous, dans notre cas, ça nous arrivait, même plus largement au sein de l'équipe, mais de recruter des gens qui n'avaient pas fait d'école de journalisme et qui étaient, au final, tout aussi bons, il faut le dire, que certains qui avaient pu en faire, y compris euh, certaines meilleures écoles. C'est pas pour autant que faire une école est un désavantage, très loin de là, au contraire, je pense que ça, il y a plein de choses qu'on apprend en école qui peuvent être euh, utiles. Ouh, je déséquilibre ce moment. <rire> euh, mais, mais en fait, c'est ce pas important. évident. Mais en fait, c'est ce important, dans, dans, dans le cas des formats courts, c'est il faut combiner euh, typiquement là, un, un apprentissage en école de journalisme avec un réel intérêt pour ces formats-là. C'est-à-dire que euh, si vous êtes intéressé par les formats courts, bah, assumez-le. Enfin, moi, je, si quelqu'un euh, veut rejoindre l'équipe et travailler sur TikTok, euh, ça ne m'intéressera pas trop qu'il soit passé par euh, le JT de France 2 ou je ne sais quoi avant. Par contre, s'il si me dit « je suis passionné par TikTok, je suis ça, ça et ça, il y a ça qu'on pourrait faire, etc. Bah, », ça me, ça me plaît beaucoup plus. Et je donne souvent le cas du premier journaliste qu a rejoint, qui, a, qui a rejoint l'équipe, Benjamin, que tu, que tu connais, qui, euh, quand je l'ai recruté, il n'était pas du tout euh, le meilleur étudiant de la meilleure école du journalisme, très loin de là. Euh, il avait très peu d'expérience dans d'autres médias. Il avait un intérêt très fort pour YouTube à l'époque. Il me citait plein de YouTubeurs en termes d'inspiration qui lui plaisaient. Il, il voyait qu'on pouvait faire de YouTube une plateforme d'information. Et quatre ans après, il est toujours là et, et, 
et je pense que c'était un très bon, enfin un excellent recrutement. Donc c'est oui. voilà, cultiver cette forme d'originalité et assumer, si jamais vous aimez les formats courts, de vouloir faire du format court. Ça ne doit pas être un choix par défaut, c'est être un choix euh, passionnel. C'est peut-être un grand mot, mais vous avez compris l'idée. Passionné plutôt d'ailleurs, effectivement. Une question, s'il vous plaît, là-bas, Elisa. Euh, bonjour, merci beaucoup d'être là. Euh, moi, j'avais une petite question, ça va peut-être sonner un peu, euh, je ne sais pas trop, mais <rire> j'y vais. Euh, sur TikTok et sur euh, Instagram, tous ces reels, tous ces, toutes ces stories, tout, toutes ces choses-là, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas... Enfin, je ne sais pas comment vous faites pour euh, réussir encore à attirer les gens après euh, trois secondes de vidéo. Et aussi, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un risque qu'on qu rende les gens un peu... Euh, imperméable à l'information parce que en fait on, on swipe on swipe on, on passe d'une préparation d'une pizza à genre euh, une manifestation dans la rue et, et j'ai le sentiment que ben, ça va trop vite et qu'on n'a pas le temps de, de recevoir l'information de la digérer et de comprendre ce qui se passe vraiment voilà ça va peut-être sonner un peu euh, vieux jeu comme question mais Je, euh je peux commencer s'il si faut là-dessus. Non, en vrai, c'est une excellente question et je pense qu'on se la pose euh, nous-mêmes. Évidemment que sur des formats plus courts, on a moins d'informations et c'est quelque chose qui est plus... Euh, forcément, on a moins de, de détails, d'analyses sur, sur les sujets. Euh, maintenant, plusieurs éléments. Je pense que cette transition sur les formats courts, euh, ça ne veut pas dire qu'on va tous aller vers des formats courts tout le temps. Euh, Aujourd'hui, un jeune peut passer du temps sur TikTok, mais il continue à passer du temps sur YouTube, sur des formats plus longs. Moi, je ne vois pas le remplacement des formats longs par les formats courts. Je vois une forme de complémentarité où euh, quand euh, tu es dans les transports, tu vas sûrement regarder quelques TikTok et quand tu es chez toi, posé peut-être devant ta télé, tu vas allumer YouTube ou une plateforme et, et, et regarder un autre contenu là-dessus. Donc je pense qu'il y a une forme de complémentarité déjà entre les, entre les différentes plateformes. Après, euh, moi j'ai toujours eu un petit personnel, un, un positionnement assez direct là-dessus qui est de se dire que oui, c'est cool de faire des docu, de faire des formats longs, etc. Mais il y a une partie de la population qui ne s'informe pas via ces contenus-là. Et dans notre cas précis, on, il y a encore un an et demi, on faisait euh, des formats qu'on continue sur YouTube qui font une dizaine de minutes. On a vu en l'espace d'un an, enfin, même moi je le vois dans les gens que je croise au quotidien, que TikTok a amené un public qui est beaucoup plus large, qui est beaucoup plus jeune aussi. Avant, personne connaissait notre travail dans les collèges. Maintenant, c'est beaucoup, beaucoup plus présent. Et, et c'est dû à TikTok. Enfin, je, je le vois. Quoi. Donc ça amène aussi, je pense, une autre audience. Il y a cette idée aussi que ce soit une porte d'entrée vers d'autres formats ou même avant même de parler d'autres formats, vers un intérêt pour l'actualité, ce qui est un élément qui me paraît assez, euh, assez essentiel. Donc cette forme de porte d'entrée, elle me paraît euh, intéressante. Et puis, euh, dernière chose là-dessus, c'est euh, certes un format euh, sur TikTok, c'est court, mais nous, nos TikTok, du coup, en ce moment, font tous euh, environ une minute. Une minute avec mon débit de parole, euh, c'est finalement assez... Euh, c'est pas mal de contenu pour dire, pour dire les <rire> choses. Et, euh, et surtout, c'est une forme de synthèse qu'on essaie d'avoir sur le contenu, c'est-à-dire que... Je ne sais pas, si on prend un sujet dans un JT, je ne sais pas quelle est la durée moyenne d'un sujet dans un JT, c'est peut-être deux minutes, je ne sais pas. Une trente. Ouais. Une trente bah Là, on a une minute, donc c'est déjà quasiment pareil, sauf que j'ai un débit de parole qui est peut-être beaucoup plus rapide, et on a peut-être certains éléments qu'on a retirés au profit d'autres, enfin, c'est juste la forme n'est pas la même, mais c'est finalement pas si court que ça par rapport à d'autres formats. Et nous, on continue à faire des formats longs à côté, on a des formats d'interview, pendant la prise d'ancienne, elle durait 45 minutes, donc euh, on ne va pas tuer les formats longs, mais je pense que les deux peuvent vivre ensemble. Et puis je pense qu'en vrai, les personnes qui, euh, de toute façon, euh, sont ciblées par TikTok, des fois, n'auront simplement jamais regardé le, le contenu long s'il avait été proposé. Ouais. Donc c'est important aussi d'adresser à ces personnes-là qui, aujourd'hui, ne consomment que du court. Ouais. Voilà. Dernière question. Allô oui. Pour conclure, est-ce que vous pouvez faire une danse TikTok <rire> non, mais... On a dit que ce n'était plus une ça, app qui danse. Alors, ça, ça, ça pourrait faire beaucoup de vues parce que ce serait très ridicule. Donc, euh, je suis très optimiste là-dessus. On va peut-être se l'éviter, mais en, en, en réalité, c'est aussi de se dire que quand on est arrivé sur cette plateforme-là, les gens nous disaient, moi je me souviens, il y avait beaucoup de journalistes avec qui je discutais dans d'autres rédacts qui disaient, mais vous allez vraiment les faire de l'info sur TikTok, c'est des gens qui dansent, qui racontent des conneries et tout. Bah non, la réalité, c'est qu'on peut arriver dessus avec des sujets, euh, avec des sujets sérieux, mais... Ben euh, esquive pour pas voilà. danser, Rémi Jean. Ouais, ouais. on, on a senti la ouais, fête. Ouais. <rire> merci beaucoup, merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. 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 Voilà, c'est fini, c'était la 14e édition. Merci beaucoup aux étudiants derrière qui ont beaucoup, beaucoup travaillé.
Merci à la régie, merci à toutes les équipes qui ont rendu cette édition possible et à l'année prochaine, décembre 2023, pour la 15e édition.